morning. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Ooh. All right, you ready? Good to morning. Go? Hold it. <laughs> All right, we streaming. We'll go ahead and do introductions first. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jim Dill. I'm the Senate Chair of the Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry Committee, and I want to welcome everybody. And I'll start with Representative McRae. Uh, well, I've lost my video. Why don't you go to somebody else, and I'll be right back. Okay, no problem. We can see you fine, and and you, but we'll go we'll go on. Uh, Representative Schofield. Good morning, Senator Dill. Good morning, everyone on the committee. My name is Tom Schofield, and I represent House District 112. I live in the town of Weld, and I represent the great people of uh, District 112, and that is the High Peaks region of Maine and Franklin and Somerset counties. Thank, thank you. Senator Black. Good morning. Uh, I'm Senator Black living in Wilton. I represent Senate District 17, which is all of Franklin County and four towns in Kennebec. Senator Maxman. Hi there, I'm Chloe Maxman. I represent Senate District 13, which is all of Lincoln County, except for Dresden, plus Washington and Windsor. Representative O'Neill. Good morning, my name is Maggie O'Neill and I represent House District 15, which is in Salco. Representative Fluker. Good morning. I am Bill Pluker. I represent Warren Hope Appleton and part of Union House District 95. Thank you. Representative Hall. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Randy Hall, District 114, six towns in Southern Franklin County. Thank you. Representative Osher. Good morning. I'm Lori Osher. I represent District 123, which is most of Ordo, the home of the University of Maine. Representative Landry. Uh, good morning, uh, Representative Scott Landry. I live in Farmington. I represent District 113, the towns of Farmington and New Sharon. Back to Representative McRae on my list here. There, I can see everybody now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Dave McRae. I live in Fort Fairfield up in the county, representing District 148, but I'm coming to you from my daughter's place in Gorham. Wow. Representative Underwood. I'm Joseph Underwood, uh, District 147 in Presque Isle. Good to see everybody this morning. Thank you. Good morning. And as I mentioned, I'm Jim Dill. I represent Senate District 5, which is Northern Penobscot County. Our clerk is Cheryl McGowan, and Taryn Netto is our analyst. And we have two work sessions and uh, five, uh, two public hearings, five work sessions. Before we get into those, there'll be a little difference in the order. Um, I just wanted to remind all committee members to make sure that you sign your bill jackets um, because I think we have three bills that uh, are still sitting there because some folks haven't had a chance to sign them. So Cheryl, do those come from you to be signed or who do they come from so people can be looking for them? They come from Casey Milligan okay. or Ada. If it's an ought not to pass, it comes from Ada. Um, Gagnon. All right. So, um, those two names will be right. on so that sheet. names you need to be looking for just in case, you know, sometimes people's names pop up you don't recognize and you may just go past it for a while and then it gets buried. So. Right, right. And, right. and if it gets too late, I send one out with big red letters. Okay. <laughs> Please sign. <laughs> <die. laughs> Sounds good. Uh, Representative McCray. Yeah. Uh, that, that is a little bit problematic because I'm getting them from two committees <laughs> and right. from always from Casey, but sometimes from uh, God knows where. And I'm, I'm never sure which ones I have approved. <laughs> so uh, I guess we'll just rely on it. If, if we've missed one, somebody's going to reach out and say, hey, get on the stick. Sure. Is that correct? Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I think as Cheryl said, she'll, she'll track you down. <laughs> I know where to find you. <laughs> Okay, with that, as I say, we have uh, uh, two public hearings and uh, five work sessions, but we're cutting the work sessions down. LD 264, an act to prohibit uh, the PFOS and uh, PFAS. Uh, we're going to delay that until next week because I know Representative Fluker is working with the department and the uh, Board of Pesticides Control to get some language. So we're not going to take that one up today. Well, that brings us back to our public hearings. Um, and uh, we do have two public hearings today. Uh, remember to keep your mics off until you're ready to speak. And during a public hearing, it should be a question um, addressed to the, the speaker, the speaking at that time. 
and uh, we'll go as we usually do. The uh, presenter of the bill will go first, followed by the legislators, then by the department, followed by folks testifying uh, for, against, and then neither for nor against. I have a timer, which I will go off at three minutes. I hope you hear that when it goes off. And uh, if you don't, I will interject and just say, you know, you've got to, uh, to finish up in one or two sentences. I'm not trying to be rude, but that way we keep everybody to uh, the three minutes. Uh, the, so with that, if uh, my co-chair, Representative O'Neill, do you have anything to add? All set, thank you. Um, next, we will start out with the public hearings. We are gonna flip flop them around. We're gonna start with LD. 1560, resolve authorizing the state to convey to the Passamaquoddy tribe the state's interest in a certain parcel of land in the town of Medibemps. And that is being presented by Senator Moore. So if you'd let Senator Moore in and while you're doing that, I'll let Representative Gifford introduce himself. Good morning, Representative. Are you there? Maybe not. I think he's frozen at the moment. We'll come back to him later. So, um, Senator Moore is not in the waiting room. Okay. Representative O'Neill, what would you like to do? Good morning, Senator O'Neill. Good, Good morning. Would you introduce yourself, please? Representative Gifford. I guess we're having trouble. Oh, she's here. Yeah. My name is Jeff Gifford. Uh, we're, we're having trouble with you, Representative Gifford. So hopefully, maybe, maybe if you and I live in Lincoln. Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll open up the public hearing on LD 1560. And I mean, probably already did that. And I will have Senator Moore go ahead and introduce the bill. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. I was actually listening in to the uh, HHS committee, we were supposed to start at nine, but there isn't a quorum. So I, we're just, well, everybody's kind of hanging out. So this is perfect timing for me. I appreciate that. All right. Good morning, Senator Deal and Representative O'Neill and distinguished members of the Agricultural Conservation and Forestry Joint Standing Committee. My name is Mary Ann Moore and I proudly represent Senate District 6, which includes all of Washington County, along with Winter Harbor, Goldsboro and Sullivan in Hancock County as well. I'm here today to introduce the governor's bill, LD1560, which is a resolve authorizing the state to convey to the Passamaquoddy tribe the state's interest in a certain parcel of land in the town of Medibemps. This resolve authorizes the state of Maine to convey to the Passamaquoddy tribe a parcel of land located on the northerly side of State Route 191 in Medibemps, which is a portion of a site known as the Eastern Surplus Company Superfund site. This site has been designated a Superfund site due to the presence of hazardous substances, materials, or wastes. This parcel continues to be listed on the national priorities list and may require further monitoring with potential remedial activities. Additionally, this parcel contains historical artifacts, is of cultural significance to the Passamaquoddy tribe, and is protected under a recorded preservation preservation, excuse me, preservation agreement. The former owner of the Superfund, Harry J. Smith Jr., Terrell L. Lord, and Lisa L. J. Lord, together with the United States of America and the state of Maine, entered into a consent decree. And I referenced that in my testimony uh, on March the 30th of 1999. The consent decree resolved the financial liability of these site owners for the cleanup of the site and included conveyance of the parcel to the state of Maine. Tribal ownership of this land is deemed to be in the best interests of the Passamaquoddy tribe and the state of Maine because it will permit the tribe to take ownership of land possessing historical and cultural significance to the tribe, protect tribal artifacts located there, and protect and address environmental concerns. Additionally, pursuant to the terms of this resolve, the tribe may take ownership of the land without assuming liability for the historical contamination the tribe did not cause, permitting continued access by the state of Maine and the United States of America to address remaining and future contamination at this or nearby lands. 
In view of all of this, I ask for your support in voting ought to pass on LD1560. And I believe David Wright will be from the, um, the director of the Division of Remediation at the Department of Environmental Protection is going to be following with some testimony that will further clarify the, uh, the efforts and what's going on with that. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak and, and uh, probably we'll need to direct his, all the questions to him. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions so for Senator Moore? <laughs> oh, come on, just one. Since you <laughs> <laughs> Representative Osher. I thank you Sarah, so much for your testimony and I appreciate that there's uh, cultural artifacts on this site and that why it would be so important to have it be um, managed and, in, and held by the Passamaquoddy tribe. However, it's a super fun site. So is this, this come along with support for the tribe to address this? I, don't, I have, have worked actually in the past on super fun sites. They were at that time um, not related to tribal communities. So I'm not sure, like, is there a provision to make sure that they're gonna be able to get the support they need for cleanup? And that is actually included with the, in the resolve itself. And I believe in all of the paperwork that is transpiring as a result of this, because they did not cause this, it's quite a mess. I drive by it once a week when I'm delivering my meals on wheels. And uh, it, is, it does, is going to require quite a bit of cleanup still. And because they did not have anything to do with that, the agreement is, is that the state of Maine and the United States will be actually taking care of the cleanup, not the tribe themselves. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Are uh, there any other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you for your presentation this morning. Sure. Next, we have David Wright from uh, DEP. Good morning, sir. There we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we can hear you, so go right ahead. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the committee, I am David Wright, the Director of the Division of Remediation at the Department of Environmental Protection, and I'm speaking in support of LD 1560 this morning. The purpose of this resolve is to allow DEP to transfer to the Passamaquoddy tribe a 3.2 acre parcel that is located on State Route 191 in Medibems, Maine, and which is part of the Eastern Surplus Company Superfund site. In the year 2000, the parcel was conveyed to DEP in order to resolve the owner's liability and to facilitate the site cleanup. Attached to my testimony is a deed restriction with a site map on the second to last page. That site map shows the Lord parcel, which is what we are proposing to transfer. The Passamaquoddy wants the parcel, despite its listing as a Superfund site, because of the site's cultural significance to the tribe. The northern half of the parcel is part of the area known by the tribe as Napoltic, which translates into our, nelt, our relative's place. Napolnatek is situated on the outlet of the Medibemps Lake, which is the beginning of the Class A Denny's River. The Abbey Museum describes, quote, Napolnatek as centrally located within the ancestral Passamaquoddy territory in Eastern Mean and Southwestern New Brunswick. This location affords easy travel by canoe to the ocean, the St. Croix River, the lakes and waterways of interior Maine and New Brunswick, and to the abundant and varied resources these settings provide, unquote. This was a central meeting place for the Native Americans for at least 8,600 years. In 1946, the adjacent Smith parcel was purchased and operated as a military surplus store, salvage yard, and hydropower facility. Numerous containers of chlorinated solvents and PCBs were improperly stored and spilled at the site during these operations, including on the Lord parcel that is being transferred under this resolve. In 1985, DP designated the site as an uncontrolled hazardous substance site 
and began an emergency removal operation, which EPA and the US Department of Defense completed in 1990. The site was added to the national priorities list of Superfund sites in 1996, and by 1999, contaminated soil had been removed from the site, followed by installation of a groundwater treatment system in the year 2000. Groundwater treatment is ongoing. The site was known to contain historic artifacts complicating the removal and disposal of contaminated soil. DEP and the United States Environmental Protection Agency work closely with the tribe on these issues. The site is listed as a Maine Historic Preservation Commission archeological site, a portion of which was added to the National Register of Historic Places in the year 2001. To mitigate the necessary impacts to the site artifacts by the cleanup activities, response action included an archeological dig at the site, development of reports, and construction of a walkway with kiosks to explain the site's history along with deed restrictions. Approximately two thirds of the Poltec area where artifacts were found in, and embedded artifacts remain is on the Lord's parcel. Among other things, the deed restrictions require that, quote, the property shall be maintained in a manner that preserves its historical integrity, in particular the setting, physical environment, and feeling, a sense of tribal spiritual life. The tribe, DEP, and EPA have reached a mutually agreeable and advantageous conceptual approach to the transfer that, one, provides the environmental agencies access to continued groundwater cleanup of the parcel and any other needed response action, which DEP and the EPA are funding. Two, provides the tribe's access for education and ceremonies. And three, inserts security of artifacts and site maintenance, such as snow plowing, lawn mowing by the tribe. Four, uses the Voluntary Response Action Program at DEP to address state environmental liability and a comfort letter to address federal environmental liability stemming from historic releases. And five, has the tribe rather than DEP defining what constitutes, quote, preservation of historic integrity, in particular the setting, physical environment, and feeling a sense of tribal spiritual life, unquote. In conclusion, we believe that this transfer is mutually beneficial for both the state and tribe. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony and I am available to answer questions to the committee both now and in work session. Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dillon. Thank you for being here today, sir. I just, I'm curious and I'll, I'll just be blunt. If, uh, how long will it take, do you believe that before the site is cleaned up satisfactorily. And, and I'll be blunt, and this isn't a way of getting out from under that in, in any way. Am I, am, I, am I correct in that assumption? Could you go deep, dip into that a little bit further? Thank you. Sure, happy to. Um, in terms of length of time, um, we've addressed the um, immediate soil contact issue by removing uh, improper disposal of the soil. The groundwater at the site is still contaminated. It's a fairly small area, but we've got is chlorinated solvents in bedrock. It's a really tough technical issue. We struggle with that all over the state. And frankly, it's gonna take decades to resolve fully. We are working with EPA on some innovative approaches to that. Historically, we installed pump and treat systems. This site has one of those pump and treat systems. Um, but what we're trying to do is use some uh, chemical oxidation techniques where we inject oxidants into the ground that breaks down the solvents. That was pretty effective in knocking concentrations down um, to resolve the mass, but it hasn't gotten the groundwater clean to drinking water levels. And um, what'll happen is there's gob goblets of the solvents down there that continue to diffuse back into the water. We are now currently trying a bioremediation system where we inject basically food 
uh, for naturally occurring bacteria and add some bacteria. And that also eats away at the chlorinated solvents. Um, so that's looking pretty promising. We need to continue that. We're hoping that speeds up uh, the cleanup. And to answer your second question, the remedy has not changed at all from this transfer. We are not abandoning attempts to clean up the site um, and the ownership um, for us addresses um, the issue of the artifacts at the site. Uh, right now, because DEP owns the site, we are also the stewards of the artifacts and need to maintain the site um, for historic and spiritual preservation. That's not really our bailiwick. And so it's, um, uh, we feel it's uh, better to transfer the site to the tribe so that they can handle those aspects. They're providing access to us so that we can deal with the environmental issues, which is our bailiwick. Thank you, appreciate your response. Representative McCray. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a very quick question, uh, Mr. Wright. Uh, it seems to me, uh, as you answered Representative Schofield's question, most of what I was going to go for has already been addressed. But I guess what I am concerned about is do you, uh, everything that should be being done at this point appears to be being done. Uh, it, is, it, it is underway, it is continuing. There are no big like, okay, in 20 years, we're gonna have to dig <laughs> to China <laughs> to, to fix this. We don't have anything that's, that's, that's being put off because it is so gigantic. It's just, we're doing everything we can do and it is gonna take, as you say, perhaps decades. Yeah, I, I, uh, that's true. Um, I do wanna caveat that with the, we don't know what we don't know. Right. Um, and I, um, you know, four years ago, ago, I would say, yeah, we've totally got this down. Um, I also thought that we were about to complete cleanup at the Loring Air Force Base and Brun Brunswick Naval Air Station. And now we're finding that we have PFAS releases and emerging contaminant and need to go back and uh, start investigations and clean up at those sites. So um, we, we don't believe that's a, that particular contaminant is going to be an issue at this site. We have done uh, soil removal, so that will have taken any unknown chemicals along um, with the, the soil that's been removed away from the site, so that shouldn't occur. Um, and the groundwater contamination itself is uh, contained, uh, so it doesn't flow offsite, it flows towards the adjacent Denny's River. Um, we, can, we have monitored uh, groundwater just before it releases into the river. We do detect solvents, but as soon as it reaches the river, we don't detect them anymore because of the dilution. So the, we know that the solvents aren't creating a problem. We know that the metals that are released by uh, natural uh, biological degradation, dropping pH releases some naturally occurring arsenic. We know that's not impacting the river. But, you know, if something came up in the future, we would have to go back in and address that. And so in the uh, folks that are paying for that and doing that work is EPA and DEP. Very good. Thank you very much. But you did get my attention when you mentioned Loring Air, mentioned Loring Air Force Base. I'm sure you did not know that that is in my home district. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are there other questions for Mr. Wright? Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Wright, thanks for your testimony. I, um, I'm seeing that you did go over a bit of the history of the site um, and the kind of contamination there. Can you, um, we don't typically talk about um, this kind of thing in our committee, so I think I'm trying to follow. Um, could you, in a little bit more detail, talk about the history of the site and the kind of contamination there and what the scale of that contamination is compared to, to other sites in Maine, just to try to understand what we're looking at. Yeah, so the uh, site is, uh, the total site, the Lord parcel, which we're transferring in the Smith parcel altogether, um, uh, there was, you know, less than 10 acres for this site. There was actually a portion of the site that was south of Route 191, which we have completed cleanup, including groundwater on. That uh, portion has been delisted. So now we're working on a approximately five acre site. 
the contaminants at that site were PCBs, um, polychloral vinyl, uh, yeah, I better not go into that, uh, PCBs from transformers and the hydropower facility. Uh, those had adhered to the soil. Uh, they don't leach into groundwater. And so during soil removal operations, those PCBs were captured. Um, there were also uh, numerous drums and jerry cans that were filled with solvents. Uh, so perchloroethylene, um, uh, chiron tetrachloride and that sort of thing. Uh, those had uh, spilled, those ran into the uh, soil. And then as rain fell on that, it leached into groundwater. Um, so the soil removed the bulk, so, uh, soil removal operations removed the bulk uh, of the, um, what we call the source of contamination. Um, and then, but there was contaminated groundwater um, at the site. And also you can get globules of the solvents, which don't dissolve in water. Uh, those will, uh, some of them will sink down uh, in the water table and then coat the surface of cracks and fissures in the bedrock. And so as we uh, pump, install pump and treat system, what we'll do is we'll pump water out of that aquifer, which is fairly small, um, and then uh, run that through a carbon filtration system. The problem with that system is uh, with oil and water, basically most of the contamination remains as gobules and smeared on the uh, rock and it just slowly diffuses back into water. Um, um, so it takes a long time for that process to occur, which is why we've tried these other techniques to try and get at those go gobules to, to actually uh, degrade the, um, the uh, chlorinated solvents um, so that we don't have that remaining smaller source but continuing source in the groundwater. Um, and then uh, one concern we have is as you have uh, natural degradation of these uh, products which are fairly recalcitrant but when you do have that degradation that drops the pH of the system um, and that uh, then allows naturally occurring uh, minerals in the rock to be released into groundwater. The one uh, mineral of concern would be arsenic. And so we've been caref carefully watching arsenic um, to make sure that that doesn't reach the river. Because while this, the uh, aquatic wildlife is uh, more tolerant of solvents, um, arsenic can be a significant problem in a water system. Did that answer your question? Thank you, that's helpful information. Um, could you also talk about what that timeline looks like? I think somebody asked you something like that. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, pump and treat system uh, would, you know, take 80 years, 90 years at the way we were going. Uh, we were spending about $200,000 per year to re remove about five pounds of um, solvent each year. Um, so we switched over to the chemox and um, bioremediation. I'm hoping with the bioremediation that we'll be able to knock it down um, uh, the mass uh, quickly within say the next five years and then allow a natural attenuation um, maybe with some supplemental food occasionally at a much lower cost to slowly um, reduce those concentrations until we reach drinking water levels. Um, you know, I, maybe that could be done, done in 20 years, 30 years, something like that. Okay. So you said 20, 30 years. And when did the, you're saying in 1946, um, the parcel was purchased. Just can I just want to get a timeline of like how. Yeah. So probably the releases occurred in um, the 60s, 70s and 80s, probably. Um, in 19, um, uh, in, in the mid 80s, uh, just before I started working for the agency, um, the contamination was found and we began to work to stop bringing more chemicals to the site and removing the drums and um, thousands of canisters of natural gas and so on and so forth that were at the site. 
Okay. So in the 80s, you stopped bringing chemicals, started removing, and then um, when did cleanup start? Uh, so uh, uh, around 2000 is when the uh, bulk of the soil removal operations occurred. Okay. All right. And, um, and what's the impact to, to people in the area? Yeah, so um, we've looked for uh, uh, groundwater well contamination, and we haven't detected any offsite um, wells that were contaminated. There is a house that's uh, directly across the river um, from the site. Uh, we did get a detect of chlorinated solvents at one point in time, but that site also had uh, solvent stored at it, and that's uh, will be a cleanup hopefully this summer um, uh, of contamination over on that side of the river as well. So we don't, um, from all the information that we've gathered and because it's a super fun site, we've gathered a lot of information. There's no indication that contamination is moving offsite into residential wells. All right, thanks for going over that. Representative Underwood. Hi, good morning. Uh, two questions. The first one is, uh, who, where are the origins of the chemicals? In other words, is it government or is it private enterprise? Exactly uh, who, or, who originated putting that stuff in there or dumping it on, in there, in the uh, parcel? Yeah. So the, the chemicals themselves were army surplus um, materials or military surplus. So the Defense Logistics Agency uh, sold um, um, military surplus stuff like jerry cans. Um, but when they were shipping trucks to the site, they also added um, drums of solvents, uh, jerry cans filled with solvents and that sort of thing. So that was the, the um, source of the contamination. And then when the, those items arrived at the site, uh, they were haphazardly stacked on the site in uh, piles of jerry cans, um, drums uh, scattered about and stacked up transformers. Uh, so they were not uh, stored or handled properly. There were a series of um, tractor trailers, uh, 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 track, uh, truck trailers that were used for storage, some uh, Quonset hut like uh, areas. Um, and then um, some of, you know, parachutes, you could buy parachutes or whatever army surplus stuff at the store there that uh, Harry Smith uh, operated. Another question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Uh, alternate sources uh, for solutions. Has there been any alternative sources uh, to, to solve this or to help you to get the chemicals out? For example, like maybe the Sandia National Labs in, in New Mexico or uh, some unconventional place similar that could assist you or would have some research or to assist you? Yeah, um, we did uh, actually call in a, a team that EPA works on, Superfund Research uh, Group, um, to uh, evaluate the site and um, do an op optimization evaluation of it. So we were spending $200,000 to get, uh, you know, uh, under five pounds of solvents removed. And we called in EPA's research group um, that also works with the Department of Defense to, you know, is, can we do this more efficiently? And they had some ideas for running the pump and treat system more efficiently. But they also said, you know, you should really look at chemical oxidation. Um, and then later they said, you should really look at these biological uh, uh, degradation processes. So um, yeah, good idea. Um, we have reached out to the, those folks. They have been to the site and we are em employing those strategies to, to uh, work on this. And that type of research is ongoing. A lot of the focus has shifted to uh, PFAS research, but um, there are quite a few really smart people with um, EPA and um, Department of Defense that, that work on these issues. And we have been availing ourselves of those resources. Thank you very much, Mr. Wright. You, represented, you have representative your agency very well. Thank you. Well, thank you. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, I have one more question about process and um, can you talk a bit more about how decisions are made to, to clean up, how projects get prioritized? Um, I'm just looking at that 20 year gap and, and understand, trying to understand there's a super fun site in, in my own community down the street, kind of <laughs> like I walk my dog there every day and um, cause it's, there's our fields and trails around it. And um, I know that they closed, there was a tannery and it closed in like 81 and in 83, they started removing materials. And then a few years after started, um, started with this whole, whole process. So I'm seeing that 20 year gap and uh -huh. I'm just curious about, kind of what went on in between? Sure, I can answer generally the way the process works. Um, uh, in general, what we do when we're uh, notified of a site is we'll investigate that site. Uh, we'll see if it looks like there has been a release or potential release. We'll review all the uh, paper records that are available uh, on that site uh, in what we call phase one environmental site assessment. Based on that, that tells us what pollutants we should be looking for and where they might be located. Then we do a phase two environmental site assessment in which we um, uh, do sampling, identify what pollutants are there and what concentration and how deep they are and how wide they are, um, what the potential, re what we call receptors in the area. So groundwater users, uh, river, um, that sort of thing are in the area. Can the contaminants get there based on what we know about the geology? We gather all that information and then we do a risk assessment on that. So we look at the pollutants and based on what we know of their toxicity, we uh, determine what concentration at the receptors would cause a risk. Then we do a feasibility study where we look at all of the available technologies to address those pollutants in this situation. We narrow down that field for a more in-depth study of some of those technologies. And then we uh, select a uh, preferred alternative to do the cleanup. We then uh, take that and do uh, design studies um, on the clean up technologies, and then we implement the remediation. Um, that cleanup is usually in two phases. The first phase is what we would call the active cleanup. Um, so that would be your soil removal and treatment. Um, you're uh, getting at source areas for groundwater. And then there's usually a long-term operation and maintenance. So if you've uh, consolidated waste on site and capped them, you need to maintain that cap and replace it occasionally. Um, for groundwater treatment, um, you may be operating a pump and treat system, and then you want to continue monitoring periodically to uh, see the extent of the contamination. So sprinkled uh, in parallel with that is finding funding to do the work. And so there's uh, two basic approaches. One is to locate what we call potential responsible parties, uh, to notify them of their potential liability, uh, to no negotiate a settlement, um, to uh, investigate and clean up the site and fund that, um, and, um, and then you know, have a legal settlement along those lines. Um, if there is not a viable potential responsible party, then the work falls to the government. Most of the 2,700 sites in the state of Maine are handled by uh, DEP or responsible parties. There are 16 of those sites that are super fun sites, including the site that we're talking about today. Um, and so often the delay that you see is as we are negotiating settlements with potential responsible parties or waiting for uh, funding either from EPA or um, the legislature to undertake those cleanups. Thank you. And and the responsible parties were, it was government owned because it was an army facility? Yeah, so the responsible parties at the uh, Medibump sites, um, in general, responsible parties are the entities that generated the waste um, that arrived at the site, persons that own the site from the time the hazardous substances arrived there. And if you hired a company to 
to uh, take your waste and they transported the waste to the site and they chose the site, then the transporter would also be a responsible party. So, I totally understand, yeah, that part of the I just, I think <laughs> you mentioned it was under, it was government yeah. entities, so it should have been yeah. easy to, to resolve yeah. if you right. so in this entities, not private ones. Right. So in this instance, it was uh, the Department of Defense Logistics Agency was the generator of the material. They stepped up to um, uh, do 85% uh, of the funding of the site. And then uh, EPA uh, has uh, provided quite a bit of funds as well. And then DEP agreed to uh, undertake the long-term operation and maintenance of the site. Um, the site owners were not uh, uh, viable. They didn't have the resources um, or technical ability to do the cleanup. All right, thanks for going over that. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, Lynn, uh, Cheryl, I have no one else that seems to be here that was going to testify, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, then I will close the hearing on LD 1560 and we'll open up the hearing on LD 1549, an act to establish the Maine Forestry Advisory Board. And that is Representative O'Neill. All right, thanks, Mr. Chair. All right, give me a sec to move some things around here. All right. All right, good morning, um, Senator Dill and fellow members of the Joint Standing Committee on ACF. I am um, Representative Maggie O'Neill from SOCO, and I'm pleased to present to you LD 1549, which is an act to establish the Maine Forest Advisory Board. This session, um, our committee has spent quite a few hours discussing and balancing different points of view on issues of forestry. And the many voices that we've heard reflect the fact that Maine forests are a vitally important resource and play many roles. Our forest support means 8.5 billion um, forest products industry. They clean our air and water. They absorb 60% of, um, of Maine's annual greenhouse gas emissions and they provide vital habitat for plants and animals. Our forest provides critical biodiversity and resilience in the face of climate change. Maine's forest is certainly of statewide, perhaps global importance. Its health and its future are integral to the well being of Maine's people, wildlife, communities, and economy. Maine forests are at the heart of the Adirondack Appalachian Forest, the largest, most in intact, temperate forest in North America, perhaps the world. For example, the Western Maine Mountains region alone, where I spent a summer maintaining trails, is home to 139 rare plants and animals, including 21 rare species, globally rare species. The area's core habitat to lynx, loon, marten, moose, and 34 woodland song songbird species. Its complex topography make it especially resilient and its intact character makes it a critical ecological link between the forests of New York, Vermont, New Hampshire to the west, and New Brunswick to the east. Yet Maine forests face serious threats, um, ranging from competition and changing markets for forest products to conversion of land uses and threats posed by insects and disease. Maine loses an estimated um, 10,000 acres of forest per year. If we want to retain the forest that defines and sustains us, we must act. LD 1549 would um, create a forum for diverse perspectives to be heard and to participate in the shaping of forest policy to ensure that future forest health and the health of the many people and businesses um, who rely on it. The main forest advisory board, um, I'll talk about the structure. It would be made up of 14 stakeholder members, including those who derive their living from the forest, um, commercial and nonprofit landowners, a Wabanaki member, biologists, and ecologists. Those members would also be joined by four um, non-voting representatives of state agencies. Following stakeholder conversations, um, I also propose 
an amendment to add a member of a statewide organization representing anglers, which I'll, um, I can present text when I submit my testimony. And this idea is, um, it's similar to other advisory committees. Um, you'll see, you know, throughout state government, we have different committees that ensure that um, the different, you know, diverse views are engaged in the development of, um, of that state level policy. And we see it often in areas that, um, that engender strongly held positions. To give some examples, um, we have the IFNW Advisory Council, the Marine Resources Advisory Council, which I think has been around in some form since, I don't know, maybe the 50s or 60s, the Right to Know Advisory Committee, and um, CLAC, which is the Criminal Law Advisory Committee. I think if you go to, um, you know, to any subject area, you'll see these kind of stakeholder groups that help advise and develop policy and bring different folks together on issues. 15 states have um, similar forest advisory boards. Here in New England, um, Vermont has one, Connecticut has one, New Hampshire has one. And um, to provide an example of um, New Hampshire's, for example, it talks about um, like the, ch the charge of the board and what they do. Um, so they address factors affecting the use, ownership and management of forest resources. And the mission of the board is to advocate implementation of the recommendations of the New Hampshire Forest Resources Plan um, to coordinate forest policy and development, facilitate dialogue and diverse interests, to assure opportunities for public part participation in forest policy development, which I think is key, and to advise the state forester in the development of state programs and policies. Um, so as the, you know, the most forested state in the nation, um, I think we have a great opportunity to join their ranks and to further promote public participation and stakeholder input um, to promote the sustainable use and protection of main force. So thank you and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Representative Pluker. Oh, uh, I <clears throat> just wanted to point out that Representative Newell, I think, was in the waiting room for 1560 when we were hearing it. And as the representative of the Passamaquoddy tribe, we did not include her voice in that conversation. So I just wanted, if there was a chance to, to have that representative speak, that would be great. I, um, I did not there. see her there. She's not there. Unless, she's, unless she registered under another name. Right. Representative Newell wasn't there because we did have her on the list, Representative. So thanks for pointing that out. And okay. I had that conversation with Representative O'Neill, too, about uh, oh. waiting to hear from her. That's why we didn't like go into work session or anything. OK. Yeah. Thank um, you for pointing that out. Though. It, yeah. And um, then I had a question on 1549. Or sorry. Yes, 1549. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Representative O'Neill, could you just give us some detail or whatever detail you you know about for the state action plan required under the federal food conservation energy act of 2008 uh no but maybe, oh, okay. <laughs> maybe folks after i don't know what you're referring to i, I mentioned the forest action plan but. yeah well that that was the that's one of their duties was to provide input on the development updating and implementation of the state forest action plan Yes. So I wasn't sure. Oh yeah, no, I can speak to that. And I think oh, um, thank you. <laughs> we have we have advocates, you know, coming behind. But as I understand it, there was a draft plan um, I think that came out in December. Um, in again, as I understand it, because I'm not a person doing this work, but um, other states um, kind of have a stakeholder process in creating that plan. And I think that's one one role that this board can offer. Um, it could, you know, instead of taking um, comments just for a short period of time um, in December to make a plan that I think lasts 10 years, we could um, have more of a stakeholder process to think about how we work in all the great work that we're doing in the Climate Council, um, which hadn't been mentioned in, in Maine's Forest Action Plan draft. Um, so I'll let other folks address that if you want to raise that again in detail about the kinds of things that could have been mentioned, um, but weren't. But you know, some stuff that I read in, in comments mentioned that citations were 
10 years old on, on things like climate change or that there wasn't mention of, um, of carbon storage the way that there could have been. Um, just that certain parts of it um, looked like uh, kind of copy and paste of, of the old plan when we're doing this work via the Climate Council and we know that it's incredibly urgent. So, um, so we wanna make sure that um, all that work is coordinated. Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna take a one minute hiatus because on 1549, I have someone that's planning to testify, or at least so my list says, which is Ernest Neptune, and it says from the Passamaquoddy tribe. And we're trying to figure out if somehow he got placed on the wrong bill. So let's go, because I, as I say, we have him on this bill anyway, so I'll ask Cheryl to let him in. And we'll see what the situation is. So can you hear me, Mr. Neptune? It is. No, it's not. It is Representative Newell. Sorry about that. Good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill. I believe there are there is a, some confusion happening. <laughs> um, but I was listening in and I was in the room for uh, 1560. And um, it was my understanding that the vice chief would be testifying if he was available uh, for this current bill that you're hearing uh, in relation to the um, uh, uh, Representative O'Neill's um, Forest Advisory Group. Um, so I'm not sure how you'd like to proceed at this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, while, while we have you, if the committee doesn't object, I will briefly close the here. Yeah, you're going to speak to 1560, correct? Yes, if I could, right. please. So I will close the hearing on 1549 until we get done with uh, your testimony, and then I'll open it back up. So I will close the hearing on 1549 and reopen the public hearing on 1560. So with that, Representative Newell, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill and other distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. I am Rena Newell, tribal representative from the Passamaquoddy tribe and I reside in Sabayak. Thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony today in support for this committee's consideration of LD 1560, a resolve authorizing the state to convey to the Passamaquoddy tribe the state's interest in a certain parcel of land in the town of Metabems. I want to share with the committee that I am currently on this parcel of land that the committee is considering this morning. Um, I've spoken, which you'll hear in my testimony, um, to Dale Mitchell, who, who, who has in the past cared for this parcel of land. Um, it is gated at this current time. It is, this particular parcel is, um, uh, has been maintained um, by Dale. Um, choosing to sit in my car, uh, Senator Dale, because of the black flies, uh, that are currently in the area. So the car is shut off and I am seated in my car, but I had hoped to give this testimony uh, and give you a visual of this land um, down by the river. However, due to the black flies, I think I'm gonna remain in my vehicle. Um, I'll continue with my, uh, with my uh, written testimony. Um, okay. With the understanding as stated in the summary of this bill, this resolve authorizes the state to convey to the Passamaquoddy tribe a certain piece of land located on the northern side of State Route 190, 191 in Metabems, Washington County, which is a portion of a site known as the Eastern Surplus Company Superfund site that has been designated a Superfund site due to the presence of hazardous substances, materials, or waste. This resolve allows the Passamaquoddy tribe to take ownership of the land without the assumption of liability for the historical contamination that the tribe did not cause and permits continued access to the land by the state and the United States to address 
remaining and future contamination at this or nearby lands. In the fall of 2018, I was approached by Dale Mitchell, a Passamaquoddy tribal citizen, elder, who serves within our environmental department as the Brownfields Program Coordinator. He works closely with the EPA in the operation of the tribe's Brownfields Program. Dale holds invaluable knowledge of the tribe's historical and cultural relationship to the land and is committed to keeping the natural resources a part of the tribe's cultural right to use and respect. He spoke with me about the work that he had been doing regarding this parcel of land with the hopes of having it returned one day to Passamaquoddy ownership. I would note that Mr. Mitchell has been voluntarily mowing and care caring for the property at his own expense. It is my further understanding that he and our tribal attorney and others have been working with the Department of Environmental Protection. From this discussion with Dale, I briefly spoke with then Maine DEP Commissioner Jerry Reed in the spring of 2019, expressing the tribe's interest in requiring this parcel of land. I am certain since that time that much work has continued, which has brought us here today. We are appreciative and thankful to Mr. Dale Mitchell, the Department of Environmental Protection for their work with the Passamaquoddy tribe and to the chiefs chief executive support in putting forth this bill today for the committee's consideration. I have included for this committee's reference, a link to an article that provides the historical relationship between the Passamaquoddy tribe and this special place. It's Metabems blog by the Abbey Museum. I would also like to mention that the Passamaquoddy people have named this place Nadolnabem, which in Passamaquoddy means our relative's place. In closing, I humbly ask for your support in the passage of this resolve that would allow this ancient village site to be returned to the Passamaquoddy tribe. At this time, I'll be happy to answer any questions that the members of the committee may have. I appreciate your time and your indulgence, uh, Senator Dill, and to the rest of the committee in allowing me to provide this testimony today. And sorry we didn't Willie recognize were. you. <laughs> you were you were using an alias on it, so representative. Apparently, Go ahead. <laughs> apparently so. Um, I would like to mention again. You know, I I've seen the markers, and um, you know, it's it's at the beginning of the you know the water. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful piece. You know, and uh, I've seen some of the restoration that's been happening on the other side, on the other side. Uh oh. Did we did we lose her? Is she frozen on everybody's screen? Representative Newell, I don't know if you can hear us, but you are frozen. Maybe she's going to try to come back in. Yeah, we'll give her a second here to see if she can get back. The universe is testing us today. I know, it's a little strange. Let me. I just sent her an aid. I noticed that she disappeared. Okay. We'll see if we can get her back here in, in a second. I 
I don't see her coming back. So what we may do is bounce back and forth here for a while this morning if we have to. So um, with the hat, I will close at least briefly uh, the hearing on 1560 and open up 1549 again. And the Representative O'Neill was answering questions and I believe Senator Maxman had her hand up if she still has a question for Representative O'Neill or if she may have forgotten what it was by now, it's been so long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just, I saw the Neptune hand go up in oh. the attendees thing and I was just gonna let you know. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions for Representative O'Neill? All right, thank you for your presentation, Representative. Um, next, again, we're still on 1549. And uh, next is Patty Palmier, followed by Troy Jackson, Craig Hickman, and Eliza Townsend. Good morning, folks. Uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on ACF. I am Patty Cormier, Director of the Maine Forest Service of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. I am testifying on behalf of the department in opposition to LD1549, an act to establish the Maine Forest Advisory Committee, or board. The bill enumerates seven duties of the board. We would respectfully suggest that six of these duties are already occurring under the umbrella of successful and longstanding programs and initiatives in the public, private, and nonprofit se nonprofit sectors, including facilitating dialogue among diverse interests involving forestry matters, promoting cooperation among state agencies involving, involving forestry matters, and ensuring public participation in the development of forest policy. The seventh duty, submitting a report to the 130th legislature, is something the Bureau would be happy to provide even in the absence of the formation of a permanent 18 member advisory board. The Maine Forest Service currently participates in and receives guidance from multiple councils, advisory groups, and boards. We are fortunate in Maine to have a strong infrastructure of forestry associations, conservation oriented NGOs, academics, agencies, and other interested parties that have existed for many years and which have demonstrated a track record of working collaboratively on issues of common concern. We value opportunities to consult with and receive feedback from these stakeholders, but do not see the need to construct another advisory board as we have numerous avenues for soliciting input that we utilize regularly and it is not clear what the new value protections or benefits of such a board would offer. One example is this is the process by which we developed the um, 2020 forest action plan, which has always already been brought up. The USDA Forest Service requires state forestry agencies to develop this action plan every 10 years to maintain eligibility for cooperative forestry assistance programs. The action plan provides an analysis of forest conditions, trends in the state, delineates priority rural and urban forest landscape areas and suggests long-term strategies for investing state, federal, and other resources to manage priority landscapes. Focusing where federal investment can most effectively stimulate or leverage desired action and engage multiple partners. So to update the, um, the previous 2010 forest action plan to the current 2020 edition, we started by convening an advisory committee of interested stakeholders. Using input from that process, the plan was updated and sent out for public comment. We again revised the plan based on those comments. We then held six virtual section sessions due to the um, pandemic being, uh, to go over the plan before it was submitted to the USDA in January of 2021. The process worked well and we received many good suggestions which were incorporated. Other public Maine Forest Service facing partnerships include outcome-based forestry panel, the State Forest Stewardship Coordination Committee, the Project Canopy Leadership Team, the Cooperative Forestry Research Unit, the Prescribed Fire Council, and the S Sustainable Forestry Initiative Implementation Committee to name a few. 
and there are many more. The Maine Forest Service, alongside many of the partner organizations and advisory groups, has successfully addressed multiple issues impacting Maine's forests. The Spruce Budworm Task Force is a good example of a serious complex forestry issue being addressed with a collaborative effort by the private and public sectors outside of a formal structure. This task force was formed to prepare for the impending spruce budworm outbreak. The goal of this effort is to assess risk and report out recommended response to an outbreak for the Maine's, Maine's forest community. Maine has a comprehensive set of forest practices laws that address clear cutting shoreland harvesting, harvesting and land use planning commission uh, subdistricts, liquidation harvesting among others, which has resulted in an abundant, well-managed forest resource. And it has been remarkably productive for many years. Other indica indicators of our successful management include the following, and I always like to focus on the good points. There is much more standing timber volume now than 30 years ago, and growth exceeds harvest, unlike the past situation. Over half of Maine's forest lands are certified to one or more major forest certification standards, and there are approximately 100 loggers participating in the Northeast Master Logger Certification Program. Landowners effectively implement best management practices on close to 90% of timber harvests monitored annually, and substantial improvement since systematic monitoring began nearly 20 years ago. Maine now has a forest inventory system in place that allows us to track the condition of the forest in close to real time. Again, this is a significant improvement over the situation in the 90s. So in summary, the goal of having main forest practices be transparent, informed by experts, and conforming to state-of-the-art procedures is one we share. We do not believe, however, that the formation of a new board, a new board that largely duplicates existing and ongoing functions is the best way to achieve these goals and I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions, Representative O'Neill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Director Cormier, for being here and for going over um, your process and updating us on what happened since um, November or um, December that I was referencing. Um, could you... Um, talk a little bit more in detail about the process that you go through because I think um, to make a distinction I'm not seeing a duplication but more of um, like a formal a formalizing of, of the process that it sounds like you're going through and to um, ensure that there's you know public and balanced stakeholder input. Sure I to answer that um, I just want to go over um, what the state forester, and I'm, I'm talking in third person because it's not always gonna be me, but the state forester um, is already authorized by law to carry out uh, many of the intended, intended functions of this board. So um, conducting information and education, planning and research programs, retain expert professional uh, consultants to assist, um, provide forest management information, clearinghouse service, promote urban and community forestry, analyze and report on the condition of the state's forest and economy. And we have a number of, of reports that are required annually to the legislature. And the legislature is currently our, our advising board right now. Um, we just, here in Maine, I, I know you mentioned other states that have these boards and here in Maine, it has been um, successful on an as-needed basis. I think it's been very successful. Um, I think the Maine Forest Service works, being in the Maine Forest Service for 22 years, I think that, that it has worked, the staff has worked very hard. Um, every day we're, we're meeting with folks and conducting basically thousands of uh, mini public hearings every day as we um, reach out to folks. I don't know if that answered your question. The, you know, when, when we're talking about the, the process of, of garnering um, public comment, it's about what is the topic? Who's the audience? What's the information we need? Uh, what, 
what are we what do we need what's the what's the end game for helping the main forest and helping provide information to you folks thank you so something that i had heard or read in the in the comments that i was referencing that i was drawing on as i was putting this together were um were the other states and it might have been new hampshire have kind of like a public listening process, even informing the plan before it goes out to public comment. And you had mentioned that you facilitate conversations um, with, you know, stakeholder folks that you might have a connection with or a working relationship with already. Um, it sounds to me like there's value in having like a formal process where, um, where a more diverse group of folks can come um, and weigh in. And I'm guessing that now that we do have a, a climate council process, there's overlap, but, um, but I just wonder if you could speak to your process, who, what stakeholders do you engage? Um, I'm trying to get an idea of that because I think there's an opportunity for, for a broader process and to formalize it and so, cause it sounds like you're already doing it and this is no criticism, um, but really looking to formalize it and, um, and ensure that that we have all these broad stakeholders at the table and to make it public, you know, transparent, open to everybody. Everybody can come to the table. Sure, thanks. Um, and I, I did wanna comment a bit on the, um, you mentioned the uh, New Hampshire as advisory board and that's a, um, that board, their, their directive is at the, at the direction of the state forester to, um, so it's a, their board is more of a has a more of an informal structure, basically um, basically the same as ours. So it's at the um, at the pleasure of the director to decide you know who's who's engaged. Um, there are recommendations on that. Um, so could you ask your question again? Sorry. Oh, I just, so I had learned about this and heard that they had held listening sessions and more of a, a public process. And part of what I want to get an understanding of is who, who are you engaging? What is your process? Like okay. who are you reaching out to now and, and working with? Okay. Since that's so, not public and formalized, I just want to have a conversation about it. Sure. So um, it, it goes to, again, you know, what, what is the, the topic for the forest action plan we have an extensive list of, of stakeholders that either uh, contacted us and said, we would like to be part of this. We sent out um, through all media outlets, web, web pages, Facebook, all the social media for engagement and for public comment a few times. And we also have a, um, a list of 10,000 that are um, signed up for our, um, we call our list serves. So they receive regular, um, regular notices of these, these um, public hearings. And it's just about, I'm, my door is open. Anybody that, that, um, that wants to be engaged in our process is engaged in our process. I, um, we, we do depend on many of the, uh, such the, say the state implement, uh, implementation uh, committee through SFI, the stewardship uh, advisory committee. These are all folks um, with invested interest and they are passing along to other folks who also might be interested in listening. But it comes down to what's the topic, who's the audience, who would be interested if we're missing somebody, then I'd love to know about it and we need to engage them. Um, like I said, doors open. The, and I, I just wanted to add, I, this, to me, this is about um, a fiscal issue. There's a fis gonna be a fiscal note with this and we don't we don't have the people to administer it. We're always we're already involved in these uh, many committees. We're getting good input. I think it's working. I think the the numbers for the condition of our forests reflect that. Um, but I'm thinking of we don't have the people to administer this, and we don't have the funding to administer it either. And that's 
that's a big part of what I'm concerned about. Thank you. I want to give other people a chance, but I just had a. Thank you. I'll go over to Representative Schofield. Okay. Thank you, Senator Dill. Good morning, uh, Director Cormier. I'm thinking that it sounds to me, and and I'm I'm fairly familiar with the with the the Forest Service in the way they do their business. It's uh, they were a sister agency, and with my old agency, and I got a great deal of interaction. And as a forest landowner, I ha still have uh, a great deal of interaction with the main forest service. And, and I'll put, I'll put this in my words and see if, see if it makes sense. Right now, it, it, the forest industry is fairly well regulated, very open to public scrutiny. Uh, and, and I'm wondering if you would agree that there's a great deal of redundancy with this proposal that already exists uh, in large measure throughout uh, the, the Bureau, the industry, and uh, the forest, uh, forest community. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that question. So yes, I mean, that, that was a big part of uh, the point of my testimony is that there's a, um, a number of redundancies and the members were already reaching these members that are suggested. Um, and I keep saying, I, I believe it's working well. We are engaging with those landowners or those stakeholders. And um, if talking about um, regulations, if you talk with a regulated community, they're probably going to say they're overregulated, right? Um, but um, it, to answer your question, yes, that there is redundancy in, in what's written in this bill. And, and um, again, it comes down to putting it in a more formal structure or it comes down to, to funding and people to do it, which we don't have. We've taken a lot of hits with positions and we just don't have the people to do it. Could I have a follow-up, Senator Dill? Sure. I know the, uh, the foresters, uh, when I was a younger man, which was a long time ago, there were a great many more foresters in the field on the on the ground, so to speak, than there are currently. Could you talk to us about what the foresters do now and, and helping with not only public relations and, and public input, but also with landowners and small small landowners? Uh, not We're not talking large company landowners. They have their own foresters. But what, what do the uh, foresters from the Bureau of uh, Forest Service do uh, for landowners and for public information. Could you expand on that a bit? Sure. So our structure right now is we have 10 district foresters uh, that cover the whole state. And when I said before about um, we do thousands of mini public hearings every year, those are the public hearings. Those folks are out with the landowner. And when I, um, when I think of one of the things I'm... Um, concerned right now is last year there was a 27% increase in real estate transactions. So that is where those district foresters are the meat of our program. In, um, in the uh, 70s, there were um, double the forests of foresters. They were called service foresters. They actually marked timber uh, rope management plans in 81, that forest was cut down to, I believe, five or six, and then it has grown back to 10. And there still is, uh, there still are six uh, mandated positions that are unfilled uh, for foresters. But they are the boots on the ground when we're looking at climate, um, climate issues, invasive insects, plants issues. We have 86,000 uh, landowners with under 1,000 acres those are the folks those foresters are trying to reach and our outreach efforts very much reflect that. Thank you, Director Cormier. And the Maxman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Director Cormier for being here. Um, you had talked about the six virtual sessions that you held to, to make the forest action plan. I was wondering if you had um, a list of who attended and how those folks were notified about the meeting. 
Sure, I could I could certainly um, get you a more in depth list list of who was uh, partnered with those sessions. Yes, yeah, it'd be great to have that for the work session, along with um, how people were notified of the sessions. Sure. Thank you. Representative Underwood. Hey, thank you for coming, uh, Director Cormier. Do you believe that this 11 HLD 1149 ought not to pass? I that that is our our position, and again. It's uh, duplicative in nature in many ways, and it'll have a fiscal note. We don't have the funding and we simply do not have the people to manage a board. Thank you, Director Cormier. Representative Blucher. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, uh, Director Cormier. I, I'm just looking at section C of membership and on this list, and I'm wondering, you know, uh, do you have the bill in front of you, Director Cormier? I do. Okay. So there's member, you know, a representative of a land trust, representative of a statewide org organization dedicated to wildlife issues, wildlife biologists, academic with expertise in forest ecology, down to the past, or I'm saying past McQuaddy, but any federally recognized Indian nation. Are those groups that you work with are, are already represented in some of the advisory groups that you already have? Those are, those are groups we work with and also um, including those we have reached out to. Oh, okay. So not, so some of them you've reached out to, but not, they haven't necessarily responded to the call to action. Correct. <laughs> okay, thank you. And then when you mentioned some of your informal groups that you've put together, who is normally represented in, on those groups? It, it again is what's the, uh, what's the topic? Um, an example going on right now is a um, brown ash task force, and that's uh, centering around um, tribal um, tribal governments and uh, members because of the EAB. So obviously, we're we're centered around um, tribal members to represent, but also other um, various stakeholders. Uh, we just went through the um, emerald ash borer rulemaking. And that's the same thing. Uh, we had public hearings and um, many, we have this uh, very long list of who we, um, who we engage with that effort. And so, and you, and who, who is generally, generally represented on that list and when you're reaching out to different groups to, to work with, I guess. So we certainly um, engage the uh, NGOs, academia, um, land trusts, um, government, you know, inland fisheries and wildlife, just um, relevant parties, tribal government, who would have an interest, who's the audience. And I, I just can't stress enough, we, that is our job, right? We, the main forest service, we cannot exist without getting that information. We, we cannot put out good information without getting that input. And um, just if, if we're not, if this bill is about us not getting with somebody, then I really would like to know who that is because we will certainly reach out to them. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions back to uh, Representative O'Neill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think my only question would be um, for the work session, could you come back with, um, with folks that you usually um, work with, um, like, you know, not maybe a list as, as close as you can get to get an idea of it, because as stated before, um, this isn't meant to be an accusation or oppositional, but really just to, um, it's a sunshine thing to, you know, make it a public process, have everybody know who's engaged. Um, so I think that'd be really helpful to, to have that. Absolutely. Well, for those, you know, those sessions that you had mentioned for the forest action plan and, and just generally stakeholders that you work with. Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dill. I guess if, if this is appropriate, I'm just, I'm just wondering if, if Representative O'Neill could express who uh, she believes is left out of this process uh, and, and, what, and what prompted this uh, 
concern because I'm, I'm just wondering where it came from. And because I, for the life of me, honestly believe that the uh, Maine Forest Service does an excellent job in this in this entire regard. And I'm just curious as to what deficiencies she might have seen that prompted this. So if that's appropriate, thank you. Representative Schofield, that's probably something for the work session during the discussion. All right, thank and you, I Senator. Yeah. Something she could bring back to the work session. I'd appreciate it, thank you. Yes. Are there other questions for Director Cormier? All right, seeing none. Whoops, Representative O'Neill's back. So sorry. Um, and Director Cormier, one more thing. Could you please send the committee a copy of the final forest action plan? It's, um, so it's with the uh, federal folks right now. Um, we called last week to see where it is because I can send you the draft, but there will be changes possibly from the federal government. Okay. So, well, it'd be helpful to see the most up-to-date version that you mentioned from January. Okay. And, and also the, um, the last plan is on, the, uh, is on our website. 2010. Yeah. For the draft. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Director Cormier? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony this morning. And I will turn to Senator Jackson. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Jackson, are you there? Senator Dale, uh, I sent you a message. I would, I would uh, defer to Senator Hickman, who's trying to run his committee. Okay. Senator Hickman. Good afternoon. It's good to see some of you from last night in person. That was lovely. Good morning, Senator Deal, Representative O'Neill, and distinguished colleagues on the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. I'm Craig Hickman. I represent Senate District 14, 11 towns in Southern Kennebec County in the Maine Senate. I'm here before you today in support of LD 1549, an act to establish the Maine Forest Advisory Board. This bill strikes me as a common sense approach to solving sometimes contentious issues. In my six years serving on this committee, four of them as house chair, we found ourselves faced with a number of forestry related issues ranging from sustainable harvest levels on public lands to harvesting in the shoreland zone to other forestry practices, including the application of herbicides for the purposes of silviculture. As this committee knows, some of these issues saw opponents squaring off over very different points of view. As an organic farmer who has served on this committee with other organic farmers and conventional farmers and a couple of bloggers, I received a great education on matters of forestry, but I believe there is a better way to address these complicated, important, and sometimes controversial issues. Establishing this advisory board would create a forum for all those perspectives to be heard outside of this committee in the full light of day to look at the forest as a whole and to find solutions that serve the common good. Maine is the most forested state in the nation. Our vast forests support not only an $8.5 billion forest products industry, but also more than half of the largest globally important bird area in the United States. It's cold water support, the last stronghold of wild native brook trout in the nation. If we expect to leave those assets to future generations intact, we must, must take steps now to ensure their long-term health. Today, as we live with the impacts of climate change, we understand more fully than ever before the importance of our forests to our own survival. Maine's forests absorb 60% of our annual greenhouse gas emissions. They absorb carbon pollution and return to us life-giving oxygen. We must ensure their sustainability for it is inexorably linked to ours. I think it would be wise to heed the advice from the great Wendell Berry who wrote, the care of the earth is our most ancient and, and worthy, and after all, our most pleasing responsibility. To cherish what remains of it and to foster its renewal is our only hope. We can do that by bringing together ecologists and loggers, land conservationists and commercial foresters, wildlife biologists and indigenous people with traditional knowledge. We can charge them with assessing the full picture of the conditions and trends in the forest and with contributing their expertise and perspectives to the development of policy that works for all Mainers, for the forest and for the wildlife that depends on it. 
And so as we go away this morning, let us go away with the knowledge that we can come together in the full light of day for all the world to see how much we value Maine's forests for all they do. Let us draw upon that knowledge of Mainers from all walks of life and ensuring our forests will remain healthy, vibrant, whole ecosystems long into the future. And so I humbly encourage you to vote for this bill today. Those are my prepared remarks, but I wanna say that, you know, I have not ever served on this committee with a variety of different stakeholders in the forestry industry after six years. Um, when I was the house chair of the commission to study the public lands uh, management fund, we were actually excited about being in a room with people who had different interests in both forestry and who loved our public lands. Not all advisory boards or committees are created equal. I think that some have more access to some of our executive branch agencies than others, and they therefore have outsized influence. And I think that this isn't a redundant request. What this proposal puts before this committee's consideration is that you bring people together from all these diverse interests and, and stakeholders, and you have public meetings where the proceedings are recorded by whoever is staffed to record them for posterity. And so there are no questions about who was at the table, who was able to get through the open door, no disrespect to the department, but I've served on this committee long enough to know that not everybody's voice is heard. Not every consideration has equal impact. And there is no other committee outside of the ACF committee that I can see that brings together all of these different stakeholders at the same time to sit down and talk through and work out some of the differences of opinion that we have on our approach to making sure that our forests remain sustainable. And so I think that this is a really good idea. I think it's about transparency. I don't believe it's redundant because there are some, some panels and I won't name them that exist regarding forestry who I just don't believe function correctly at this point in time. And they would be at the table, however, working with everybody else so that these diverging points of view could be discussed, debated, and we can come to some common ground, common sense solutions about how to move forward to make sure that our forests are maintained for future generations. And with that, I'll be quiet and take any questions if you have them. Thank you. For there, thank you this morning. Representative Schofield. <clears throat> thank you, Senator Hickman. Nice to see you this morning. Thank you. Uh, let me fix this here. Moses asked you, yeah, okay, I will. There I did. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. My fingers don't work all the that well on the screen. I'm, I'm just... Uh, I hear you. I hear what you're saying, Senator, and I understand what you're saying, but I think that the ability for folks to uh, be heard is there. I, I don't think everyone does participate, but I don't think that, that there's, but I think there's an opportunity for everyone to participate. And I think that's the difference. I, I think that I think that whether there's an opportunity provided and whether people partake of that opportunity are two separate issues. What do you think about that? I mean, we talked about we talked about being stakeholders at the table. Uh, do you think the opportunity does not exist for stakeholders to be at the table? And could you explain that for me, please? Thank you. Well, I think that the Public Reserve Lands Management Fund Commission that I referenced in my testimony was the first time I had been in the room talking about those kinds of policy initiatives with people from different parts of both the forestry industry um, and, and other stakeholders. And our meetings were formalized and Adil served on it. Um, I think he might be the only other person that served on it that's in this committee today. It was exciting to hear the history that people brought to the table, to hear the issues that impact each part of it, of the industry. Again, loggers are not foresters, foresters are not loggers. And so 
I learned a lot. We wanted that commission to continue. And that didn't happen, but we thought it was a good idea if it did. This, this advisory committee or council or whatever it's called in the bill that is proposed to me isn't exactly that, but it is certainly similar to that. And so it's not about the opportunity to walk through a door that's open. It's about people who are appointed by the legislative leadership, by the governor, by however it is it listed in this bill to be a part of a formalized, transparent public process that we know who is there and who isn't. And we can hear the debate and we can see the notes and we can and we can get the presentations in real time that may only be going to some folks in the department that we can't see. And so I think that it's not about just the opportunity to engage with the department when coming up with its plans. It's absolutely about everybody being around a table together in the open light of day and having these conversations amongst themselves so that the public can see it, hear it, weigh in on it, not just provide public comment after the fact, but maybe even testify in person like we are doing here today, even on a Zoom screen. And so to me, it's not either or, those open door conversations can continue, but this formalizes the process and it makes it very transparent and I'm 100% for it because the legislature charges the executive branch with implementing our will, the will of the people. And we have to have oversight over that process from start to finish. And we just haven't necessarily seen, especially when it comes to forestry issues, how that works and the processes that go into making these decisions. And with people not trusting government today so much, you would think that this would be something that we as lawmakers would jump on, no matter the department's testimony. So that's my feeling. Thank you, Senator Hickman. I, I, I understand, I truly believe in government transparency. I am have always been an advocate for that. And so I agree with you on that wholehearted. And I just think that part of our function on this committee is to ensure that transparency with the departments. And uh, I think that's our job to do that. And uh, but I appreciate your, appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative McRae. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you, Senator Hickman. Uh, you. <clears throat> uh, I did pass you. <laughs> briefly last <laughs> evening. Anyway, uh, it appears to me that <clears throat> maybe part of this bill and other committees or panels, <clears throat> in fact, probably do have some overlap mm -hmm. and therefore some redundancy. But it also seems to me that this bill, uh, maybe it's going to need to be tinkered, but this bill, if passed into law, would provide for uh, uh, additional information, additional conversation, uh, and and wherever it's redundant, the job's going to be very easy. It's already been done. And where it is not redundant, it's work that needs to be done. Do you see this that way? You know, I do. I will ask the committee to turn its attention back one session to how we reinvigorated the Water Resources Planning Committee. Um, which some of the members of the committee might be familiar with because they voted for the bill last session. And I, I would ask that perhaps a representative, you bring those, those, that file to the work session because you know, our water is about our life. Our forests are about our life. Our soil is about our life. And that water resources planning committee uh, is a very good example of the way in which this committee said Let's bring a lot of different stakeholders together who have very different needs and interests from the water. Let's bring all these people together who have very different needs and interests in forestry. And it's, so to me, it's a very similar thing. And you know, to address the fiscal note issue, I don't know how much it's gonna cost to do those reimbursements that are in the bill, but I don't suspect that that's gonna be extremely expensive. And the staffing of it, can be amended if it's not already there to ensure that we have nonpartisan staff overseeing the work of what is the final board. 
Oh. There's you. nothing wrong with redundancy. As a poet, I can tell you that. <laughs> Thank you. Robinson Rand Landry. Uh, good morning, Senator Hickman. Good to see you again. Too. Uh, what groups or you know, what groups do you feel need to be on this advisory committee that aren't already represented? I, I really appreciate the fact that, you know, transparency is important. Who do we have to bring to the table? Well, I, I mean, I think that the draft of the bill is a strong start to look at who should be on it. I, I, don't, I don't object to any of the proposed membership in the bill. And once again, that's what's in front of you today. I don't know how often and when and where some of the same stakeholder groups reach out to the department to provide their input. I don't doubt that it happens. I am absolutely believing in the word of the director on that, but we just don't know it. And so this makes it very clear. Here are the people who are invited to be a part of this board. And when the meetings happen, we will know who's at the meeting and who isn't, and people can watch the proceedings. And I just think that's what the people want right now. They want transparency. They want a seat at the table. And if they're not at the table, they want to see who is, and they want to be able to weigh in in the most direct, real-time way as possible. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question, Representative. Are there other questions for Senator Hickman? Seeing none, thank you for your talks. Uh, Representative Osher. Oh, sorry. Senator Hickman, thank you so much for joining us today. And you have so much experience that I wish I knew what you know. So uh, I wanted to just uh, say that uh, what we heard from the department wasn't that this, that it wasn't important to have different stakeholders, just that they thought that they had covered it. But really it sounded um, like there's not enough money to cover the tasks they already need to do and they want to put a fiscal note on this because this will staffing this will cost money so can you as someone who's been the chair of this committee and, and has spent many sessions talking about the budget and the budget for acf and budget for forestry just educate me a little bit about uh, about your response to that kind of budget staffing issue yeah, again I thank you, uh, Representative Osher, for the question. I'm not um, a budget guru. I certainly have worked on budgets with this committee, but I don't know that staffing a committee such as this outside of the department, I don't know if the bill says the department must staff it. I think the department is included in being on the commission or the, the board, but these are not staffed by the department. They are staffed by nonpartisan members of either OPLA or the Legislative Council, one or the other, and usually OPLA. And so I guess you could get for the work session how much money we spend staffing these many boards and commissions that we have that are codified in statute. Um, it's, it, might, it might be $10,000, it might be $15,000, it might be $30,000, I'm not sure because it's reimbursement costs for the most part, um, according to the laws and rules of the legislature. But I don't see it as, I don't believe that the costs should be prohibitive when we are talking about the viability and sustainability of our forests. That's something, they're on private land, they're on public lands. The people are absolutely willing um, to, use their taxpayer dollars to ensure that they have access to a transparent process. I don't have any doubt about that. And I think that as everything else that goes to the appropriations table, if this bill were to get there and there's a fiscal note on it, then the appropriations committee would do its job and prioritize you know, what to fund and what not to fund. But the policy here, I believe, is prescient. I think it's necessary. And I hope that the committee actually considers um, doing it because legislative oversight and what we do is what we do. The people give us the power to represent their interests. Uh, so you mentioned, uh, and I'm sorry, I did not write down the name, the name of another commission that you served on uh, and participated in. I just, um, and Representative Schofield mentioned his previous experience. So I have previous experience working for the Forest Service and the Forest Service would do forest planning 
And I ended up, I worked in over the many years I worked for the Forest Service, I went, worked on three different forests, two in management positions. And one is just a st regular staff. And, but it, and so certainly when I was in the management positions, what I noticed is that the forest planning process invited people to the table after the plan was done and then said, oh, we invited the local tribe to weigh in on what we're planning. And I was like, they need to be at the table in the beginning of the planning process. So I, I appreciate the idea of having a group of stakeholders that would get together that are visioning what they want to see for the health of the forest and for everyone to have a quote seat at the table. So can you tell me a little bit about how, um, because the other thing that the um, commissioners talked about was uh, that we there's already, the testimony said out of the seven things described, there's already six of them are being done. So can you describe, address that? Well, like I said, I, I think that having a formalized, open and transparent process is important. I, again, I don't doubt that the director, Director Cormier has provided you with accurate information about how the department goes about receiving input I just don't see how that needs to only be the way that it's done. That can continue to happen as it happens. And this can also happen if you vote for it to happen. And so I just encourage you to vote for this to happen. That's all. Thank you. Are there other questions? All right, seeing none. Thank you, Senator Hickman. Thank you. Um, I will go back, but I think we may have lost him. Do I see Senator Jackson? He probably had to go on to something else. See if he sent me a text or anything. Um, I don't see anything from him. Oh, so he's back. Senator Jackson. Yeah, you're bouncing around on me here. I've been here all along, Justin. One of those days, I guess. <laughs> uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, members of the Joint Standing uh, Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Troy Jackson. I have the great honor of serving as President of the Maine Senate. I proudly represent Senate District 1, which is northern Rosa County, stretching roughly from Caribou North, St. John Valley. I'm here to testify in support of LD 1549, an act to establish the Maine Forest Advisory Board. As all of you know on this committee or are aware, I've spent a large number of years working as a logger in the forest products industry. In addition, I represent a large constituency of those who have worked higher in the woods, make a living for their families. Both these factors were a big part of the reason why I ran for the legislature in the first place. And as a result of the course of my years of service, I have worked on a number of proposals related to the economic impact environmental conditions of log in the forest products industry. There's no doubt that the forest products industry is an essential part of our character, economy, heritage, environmental landscape. Maine is the most forested state in the nation with 17.5 million acres of forest, covering nearly 90% of our land mass. The forest products industry contributes over $8 billion to our economy annually, and our forest provides a wide range of recreational activities that Mainers across our state enjoy. As time goes on, however, we as Mainers continue to face an increasingly complex mixture of problems in our forests. The issues include climate change, drought, fire, insects, and wildlife, and certainly habitat management. For one example, in this year alone, this committee has already dealt with a number of important and complicated proposals on the use of herbicides and glyphosates in the Maine woods. It's critical that conversations around Maine forests take into account a wide variety of factors for making decisions on public policy. This bill aims to address the complexity of these issues by creating the Maine Forest Advisory Board. The board would include representatives of the law industry, nonprofits, wildlife organizations, as well as the departments of agriculture, conservation and forestry, inland fisheries and wildlife, and marine resources. The board will provide input on the state forest action plan required under the Federal Food Conservation Energy Act of 2008. The board is directed to submit a report outlining conditions and trends in the state's forest to the second regular session of the 130th legislature. And I believe Mainers deserve to know 
that our forests are managed in a thoughtful and comprehensive way, one that respects the livelihoods of people working in the woods, protects our natural habitat and public health, and ensures that future generations can enjoy the beauty that our forests bring to everyday life. I uh, definitely enjoyed uh, sitting here listening to the conversation and you know, the idea, I wish Director Cormier was still on, the idea that everyone is being heard in this industry at this point, I, I, I believe is inaccurate. Um, like I said, and look, I'm not trying to dig in just because of um, the aerial herbicide spraying issue or anything like that, but I think that's a symptom of what's going on. You've heard Director Cormier talk in your testimony about the fact that they were told not to come to a public hearing in an area that was affected on forestry management issue. Who told them that? I know, I know exactly who told them that, but you know, to say that the people in my area were represented by the forestry department and that issue is completely untrue. There's definitely been times here in the past couple uh, months when issues of cabotage in the forest products industry has happened. Uh, people that work uh, in ACF on the ground, I have great, great respect, great, great confidence in, uh, feel that they want to do, um, you know, their job to the utmost ability. Uh, but, you know, we've had the director, or well, we've had the commissioner in here and talked about these issues. And, and as soon as um, they leave the office, the decisions are already made uh, because they've talked to other people um, that, that they have a much greater relationship with. And the very first time that I met Commissioner Beal was at uh, the uh, Maine Potato Board dinner in Easton, Maine. She told me that uh, she had just come back from having a tour with the Maine Forest Products Council. Great. I offered that she come up and have a meeting with uh, my constituents, and we're still waiting for that. So the idea that people are uh, being heard is, is not accurate. And, and those of you that have been on the committee for a long time know that whenever I was part of the committee back in 2013, you know, I brought forward uh, a bill to have uh, loggers. Now, now well, really listen to this. Senator Black, you were there, Senator Dill. Listen to this to the rest of you. The, the bill was to say that when a contractor asked to be asked to be told what they were going to be paid by a landowner that they were they were given the amount of money that they were going to be paid for for cutting and trucking wood just if they asked to know what they were going to get paid that the landowner had to give them provide them that and the industry fought against that and now senator black senator dill we actually did vote for that and supported that and put it in what is considered the 14 day rule. If you ask anyone from the forestry department about the 14 day rule, that's, that says that after 14 days in the summertime, you can ask for a state scaler to come and scale your wood because as Senator Black knows, it dries out. And, and if you're paid on tonnage, you're gonna lose money. That happens all the time. The, there's dust on the 14 day rule, six feet thick because no one dares ask for it. No one, no one in the logging industry dares ask for it. I have huge contractors in Northern Maine that work for big landowners that ask me all the time about how they can get paid for the wood that's on the ground that's sitting there drying out. And I said, well, call the state scaler. I, I, I can't do that. I, I, I'll lose my contract. Senator Black, me and you talked about this the other day. The, the price of wood at home. Chairman Dale, can, Chairman Dale, can we keep this uh, discussion to LD 1549, the current, dish, the current uh, bill, please? Representative Underwood, I am talking about the reasons why this advisory council is needed. Continue, Senator Jackson. Issues like that need to have a place that people can speak about it in the, in the daylight, not be afraid of being blackballed. And if they are blackballed, then there's a clear record of why they got blackballed because they came in front of a government committee and talked about the issues that were affecting them when they asked the government to help them and no one did. And that is happening currently 
That's why having a, a commission that actually could go out and talk about this in the light and protect people, because the only way you protect these people is make sure that everyone sees what's happening. And that's why I want to thank Representative O'Neill for putting this forward. She doesn't work in the forest products industry. She did it out of the goodness of her heart. You all can think about whatever you think about me. I don't really care. But I know what's going on out there. I know that people are being affected by it. And government under all different administrations, Republicans, Democrats, and independents, has done nothing to help them. So if we want to continue to perpetuate this idea that, that you know, things are great and, and we'll just pick things up, that, that's not the case. That is not what's happening out there. People are losing their, their, their equipment. They're losing their livelihoods. They're choosing to get out of it because they are not making the money that they should. And that's why I think something like this is at least an opportunity to try and bring light and, and give people at least a voice. You know, and in the end, if we don't, if they don't get what they want, well, that's fine. But at least they had an opportunity to talk about it with somebody that could make a change. Thank you. Are there questions for Senator Jackson? Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, President Jackson, for your testimony and for being here today. I had, um, in passing, you had mentioned not only the 14-day rule, but um, but another example of um, of legislation that you had worked on when you were chair of this committee. And I think it had to do with weighing and getting a number um, before. Can you talk, do you know what I'm referencing for folks to be able to get a weight before? I think it's, a, it's another compelling example of, um, of why stakeholder input is needed and and just the kind of thing that might surprise people to hear. It's just the craziness of how the industry works where people are actually doing the job on the ground. And, and I know Senator Black knows this, and, but when, when, when you, some of these got landowners, when you, you're working for them, that they actually get you to go and cut wood, they get, actually get you to go and truck wood, but you don't know what you're getting paid until after it's hauled to the mill. And then you you get whatever whatever they decide to give you, and 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 you know there's there's a real unfairness in that obviously because there's no way that you can ever ever say well that's not the right amount or you know we agreed on something else, and and the the law that we passed I think some of the members on the committee were really struck by are, are you serious I mean this 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 is happening and and, and it ended up being an average report of, of that committee our committee. But this, all it said was, if I go to a landlord that I'm working for and I ask to have the amount that I'm going to get paid per time to either have something cut or have something trucked before, that you have to give it to me. Now, I don't think the same ones use that either. Uh, because if you do ask for something like that, which is as simple as knowing what you're going to get paid before you actually do the work, you're considered a troublemaker. I guess I understand that very well. Other uh, uh, representative Osher. So, thank you for sharing your testimony, Senator. And I, as I had to say with Senator Hickman, I am new to this committee. And although I've worked as a scientist in the Forest Service, I am on <laughs> the Forest Service. It was on uh, those were all public lands, and here in Maine, it, the, it's mostly private land. And so I'm as not as familiar with how these have timber sales work. Um, and I, so I would like to know a little bit more specifically how this proposed uh, committee or commission will, will help with this challenge of, of people who are cutting trees, not knowing how much they're gonna get paid for the work that they do and feeling afraid to request government intervention to help make their, um, to have them understand and know how much the work, the work of their labor, labor will be be remunerated. Honestly, Representative Osher, I, I'm not sure that that's really going to happen. But what I do think is that there's an opportunity for real people that are doing the job on the ground, people that log and trap that don't work in or aren't part of any organizations that have the close ties to the main force, Frogs Council or uh, main forest service. 
uh, actual everyday people can maybe sit down and talk about these issues and talk about how these things are happening and maybe some of the current laws that aren't, I mean, that's probably the greatest lesson that I've learned in my time here is that all these laws are awesome, but if no one enforces them, then they don't mean anything. Uh, so people could actually at least try and get enforcement of current laws or talk about why maybe we ought to change other laws. Uh, but, but I'm not saying that it is going to make a difference or anything like that. I'm saying that it will give them an opportunity, which I don't believe they're getting right now. I mean, look at the people that's going to speak against, against this uh, today in the lineup. Uh, the reason why is because they already have an in with the department. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony this morning, Senator. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. You too, Representative Underwood. Next is uh, Eliza Townsend, followed by Heather Spaulding, Melanie Sturm, and Jeff Ridd. Good morning. Senator Hill, Representative O'Neill, distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. I am Eliza Townsend. I'm the main conservation policy director for the Appalachian Mountain Club. Pleased to address you this morning in support of LD 1549 and not a little intimidated to be following Senators Hickman and Jackson. AMC is the nation's oldest conservation, recreation, and educational organization with the mission to foster the protection, enjoyment, and understanding of the outdoors. We have 6,500 members in Maine and own 75,000 acres of forest land in the 100-mile wilderness region of Piscataquis County, which we manage for multiple uses, including sustainable forestry, carbon sequestration, backcountry recreation, and environmental education. We're currently fundraising to acquire an additional 27,000 acre parcel, which we are currently managing. Contracting with local loggers, we harvest 6,000 cords of wood per year that are delivered to local mills. We also have entered into three separate contracts to achieve increased carbon sequestration on lands that we harvest both for timber and on those left in their natural state. We clearly have a strong interest in the health of both Maine's forest and of the forest products industry. That is why we strongly support LD 1549. Before moving on, I want to acknowledge the evident stress that we could hear this morning from Director Cormier about levels of staffing, and that is something that is notable. I'm not sure that it is an argument, however, against what I regard as a relatively modest bill. This bill would add Maine to the list of states that convene diverse interests to advise on the state of the forest and on the policies that can ensure its sustainable management. This approach has worked well elsewhere and has had additional benefits as described in the attached letter from my colleague, David Publicover. Dave has served on the New Hampshire Advisory Board for 20 years. It is an approach already being taken at two other natural resource agencies, the Department of Marine Resources, whose advisory council was established in 1973. And before that, the Department of Sea and Shore Fisheries had an advisory council going back to at least 1954. And the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, whose advisory council was established in 2003. With 17.5 million acres of forest, Maine is the most forested state in the nation, and the forest plays a role in every aspect of our lives, from cleaning the air we breathe and the water we drink, to supporting an estimated 30,000 jobs, to supporting our tourism and recreation economy, to combating climate change by sequestering carbon. As important, the forest is an ecosystem which supports numerous species of plants and both terrestrial and aquatic animals. Increasingly, we recognize that we must act to protect ecosystems if we are to protect the future of the planet. For example, the bird population in North America has plummeted by nearly 30% since 1970, and more than 75 studies have documented sharp declines in insect populations worldwide. Maine's vast forest has a significant role to play in preventing the collapse of nature. 
biodiversity and the habitat connectivity afforded to species by an unfragmented forest can help ensure the continued healthy populations of both plants and animals. A large, healthy, connected forest that supports biodiversity is one of the ways that we can achieve Maine's target of carbon neutrality by the year 2045. Given the forest's importance, again, engaging a wide range of perspectives in evaluating its condition, sharing information, and planning for its future makes sense. It also has the potential to reduce the intense policy struggles over the forest's current condition and its future that so often spill over into the legislative arena. And I'll point out that the debate over herbicides is just the latest example in a long history of such disputes. Convening an advisory board made up of landowners and biologists, land managers and ecologists, loggers and in, an indigenous representative would ensure a very different discussion, one more comprehensive in its scope. Looking at our forest comprehensively is what is called for as we look to combat climate change, ensure ongoing biodiversity, and support a robust forest products industry. Uh, attached to my comments are a letter from Dave Publicover, who is a, a forest, a forester, <laughs> who has served, as I said, in on New Hampshire's advisory board for 20 years. And I would just add to my comments that um, I'd be very interested to hear more about the concerns about funding. The Marine Resources Com Advisory Council receives no compensation other than expenses. We've all le learned to live in the world of Zoom. It is possible to communicate in a, a variety of ways. And additionally, we heard that the Forest Service is communicating with a number of s different stakeholders separately. I can imagine having these conversations in one place, which would be the point, and that I don't understand why that would take more effort than having multiple separate conversations. Can you finish um, up, Madam Sure. Yeah, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Are there any questions for Eliza? All right, seeing none. Oops. Representative O'Neill, slow with your hand today. <laughs> it is. Um, thank you for your testimony. I wondered if you had anything to add. I'm sorry. Did you say anything to add? I do. I, I do want to encourage you to. Um, I, I won't occupy more time by reading it, but uh, please read Dr. Publicover's letter about his experiences in New Hampshire, where this uh, form format has existed for a, a good long time, and it has been very successful in bringing people together to have conversations that otherwise don't take place. Um, I also, I, I was, um, I'll be also very interested to hear more about the process that took place around the forest advisory plan or the forest action plan as it was developed. I participated in each of the opportunities to which I was invited, which consisted of one webinar and submitting comments. Uh, we were given, I think, three weeks to comment on the action plan. And when more recently I requested a copy of what had been submitted to the federal government, I was told that I could not have it. Are there other questions? Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could you talk a little more about what that process was like on your end? Uh, did, how you were invited, what the conversations were like? Um, so there was an email that went out to, uh, a, I don't know how large a group, um, uh, during which, so we attended a webinar on these are the steps, I think, uh, Representative Overture, you have <laughs> you have some experience in terms of um, we were not invited to give input in that webinar in terms of the issues on the ground. We were told what the this was very much a listing of what the steps would be in order to submit the plan. Um, and as I said, we were invited to comment on the plan in December. Um, the draft that I saw uh, was. I think slapdash is not too strong a word. Um, it, it contained references to circumstances that no longer exist in Maine. Uh, it did not contain science on climate that was any fresher than 10 years old. 
it um, it was a hodgepodge of cut and paste, frankly. Um, and one might argue that this is an academic exercise. On the other hand, that we're forced to, to conduct in order to draw federal funds. And the, the Forest Service is highly dependent on federal funds. That said, it's a lost opportunity um, to look at it as something that you have to do and not something that gives you the chance to hear from a wide variety of people about what they're seeing on the ground and understand what is happening in this very large state um, is a lost opportunity. Thank you. Are, are there other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. I would also remind all of our committee members to be respectful at all times. And if you do have a point of order to please make it through the chair in the future as we move forward. So, thank you. Uh, next is, I believe, uh, Heather Spaulding. Uh, good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill and members of the ACF committee. My name is Heather Spaulding and I'm Deputy Director of the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, MOFCA. MOFCA supports LD 1549. It's important to us because while all of our members want Maine to have healthy forest ecosystems, most of our farmers and many of our members also have woodlots that they wish to manage in the spirit of organic land management practices. We run a low impact forestry program, which includes loggers, foresters, landowners, farmers, and interested persons teaching, practicing, and advocating for ecologically based and economically sound forest practices. The Maine Forest Advisory Board would ensure that advice going to the Department of Forestry and other administrative departments would include input from stakeholders with demonstrated interest in forest ecology. We hope that the level of discussion would evolve so that environmental health would garner as much, if not more, consideration as do short term, uh, short rotation market interests. I serve on the Natural and Working Lands Working Group of Maine's Climate Council, which has prioritized an ambitious list of goals for supporting our forest ecosystem and economy. There's an incredible amount of work to be done to reach the goal of carbon neutrality by 2045, and we're just getting started. Um, my written comments list 14 of those goals. Um, the main forest advisory board would be of critical importance to helping us achieve the goals. And the advisory board would be distinct from, the, and distinct from and complementary to the natural and working lands working group of the Maine Climate Council, because the board would be lasting and would specifically advise the Maine Forest Service at the full suite of the agency's work, not just climate related matters. Um, I wanted to mention that this week, the National Organic Standards Board is holding its spring meeting online. And this is a great example of how an advisory board can work to ensure that administrative departments are held accountable to existing law. Uh, in this case, the NOSB works to provide recommendation to, recommendations to the USDA's National Organic Program <clears throat> to the staff to ensure that practices comply with the Organic Food Production Act. Board members represent a huge, very broad array of interests from across the country, and they regularly host public meetings with input from thousands of stakeholders. Um, this democratic process promotes a thriving organic farming sector while ensuring that human health and environment do not take back seats to market interests. Um, at least 15 other states have established forest advisory boards, and we hope you'll support this bill so Maine can broaden its awareness of the critical role that forests play in the health of our environment, and so we can work collaboratively to develop a thriving and a sustainable forest economy. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next is Melanie Stern. Good morning, thank you. Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill and members of the committee. I'm Melanie Sturm, the Forest and Wildlife Director at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. And I appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony in support of LD 1549. Thank you, Representative O'Neill for introducing the legislation. 
As you well know, Maine has long relied on its forests for timber, jobs, recreation, and inspiration. And more recently, we have learned how important our forest, forests are for storing and sequestering carbon and protecting biodiversity. Currently, state agencies in, in conjunction with this committee and stakeholders set rules, regulations, and laws to manage and monitor the state's vast forest lands. But Maine as a state is experiencing changes in demographics and the structure of our economy. And we know that issues regarding forest management have been divisive at times in the past. We believe LD 1549 could be a way for building understanding regarding forest management that could lead to better outcomes for Maine's natural resources, businesses, and people while ensuring all sides have a seat at the table. Although Maine's forests have been managed for multiple uses for many years, potentially competing uses and divergent points of view have become more challenging and more complicated to address in recent years. The makeup of people, businesses, and landowners who interact with Maine's forests has shifted and so have the biological and environmental elements. Invasive species, pests and disease, climate change, and wildfires are all major threats to Maine's woods that have always existed but have intensified in recent years. These threats to habitat also impact Maine's fish and wildlife populations. Given all this change and the continued importance of Maine's forests, we support creation of a Maine Forest Advisory Board as called for by LD 1549. This board would would create a forum for evaluating forest resource issues through collaboration. Much like the advisory boards for the Department of Inland Fish and Wildlife and Marine Resources, this board would consist of a wide range of forest resource interests and would promote dialogue, develop policy recommendations, facilitate interagency information sharing, and ensure public participation. As you've heard, analogous forest advisory boards have been created in more than a dozen other states. In these other states, the boards have served an important role in helping depoliticize complex issues regarding the stewardship of public and private forest lands, bringing diverse interests together to deliberate multifaceted issues and work towards common goals would be a benefit to Maine and an improvement over existing processes. For these reasons, I respectfully urge the committee to vote ought to pass on LD 1549. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony this morning. Uh, next up, we have Jeff Ridden, followed by Dana Duran and Patrick Strout and Tom Doak. Am I, am I, can you all, can you hear me? Uh, oh, we can I've, got, I've got my video camera turned off. There we go. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Jeff Reardon, and I'm testifying on behalf of Trout Unlimited, a conservation organization whose mission is to conserve, protect, and restore North America's trout and salmon in their watersheds. I'm testifying on behalf of, of six main chapters and over 2,000 members in support of LD 1549. Uh, I'm going towards the end here, so I'm, I'm not going to read all of my testimony, much, much of which has been covered by other people. Um, I'm going to skip the whole first paragraph, except the pieces that are most critical to us at TU which is that um, you know, we, we work on brook trout and salmon, Arctic char, uh, landlocked salmon, all of which are, are forest creatures. The reason that Maine has the nation's best strongholds for all of those species plus lake whitefish is because we've got intact forests in a way that no other state, at least no other state east of the Mississippi um, has. Um, and, that, and that's really critical. Uh, unlike wildlife and fish, uh, there is not an equivalent to the DMR or, um, or IFNW advisory councils for forests. Um, I, think, uh, I think Senator Hickman um, and, and others were pretty eloquent about the difference between what, what appears to be fairly informal consultation that um, the Maine Forest Service does on these matters and the formal process that has agendas and meeting minutes and is open to the public that uh, other agencies have. And there's a, there's a variety of structures. If, if you look at how these things are set up, you know, the Inland Fisheries Advisory Council is a little bit different from DMRs and, and those are different from some of the other advisory groups. I'm not sure what's exactly the right model here, but what's proposed in this bill and what we would support for the Maine Forest Service is something that is purely advisory. Uh, if you look at how the purposes were drafted in the bill, this is entirely about engaging the public um, in, a, in a formal way 
in um, various uh, policymaking, rulemaking, et cetera, that, um, that the Forest Service carries out. Not engaging them in a regulatory way, the way, say, the Board of Environmental Protection or the LUPC board does, or even the kind of formal role in the rulemaking process that the IFNW Advisory Council has. I think really this is about finding ways to engage the public. As a member of the public who's been doing this for a very long time, I will say I don't have much difficulty um, interacting uh, in public, knowing what's going on with the Department of Marine Resources um, or the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And partly that's because I work with those folks more often. Um, but I got to say, participating in these processes at the Maine Forest Service is really kind of opaque to me. Just finding things on the website is difficult. Uh, I, I will give you an example. I heard today that uh, the Forest Action Plan has been submitted to the feds. Um, it may or may not have some changes that responded to comments I submitted back in December, but I can't find that document on the department's website. Um, so I have no idea. Um, I, I'm, I'm not even sure I got a formal notice that my comments had been received, and I, don't, I can't tell uh, if those comments were addressed. Now, now I, I confess I've not called anybody up to ask for it. Um, by contrast, the exact parallel process at the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife is going on right now to develop a 15-year fisheries management process. That's been five years in the making with literally dozens of people formally engaged on a variety of working groups, um, at least six or eight public meetings, a formal survey that went out to randomly selected in-state and out-of-state license holders. Um, and there's a website, the link is in my testimony where you can go and you can see all the products that have been produced along the way. Uh, sometime this summer, we'll see a draft that will have an additional round of public comment, but it's, it's a very open and transparent process. I don't think the advisory council is the only reason for that difference, uh, but I think it helps and it pro would provide a forum where if that wasn't happening, um, the public could show up and, and raise that issue with the advisory council who could elevate it to the commissioner. Can you uh, finish up in a step two, please? And that is it. We strongly support this. Um, we appreciate um, Representative O'Neill's uh, suggestion of adding fisheries expertise to the board, and that's in my written comments, too. And thank you for your time. Representative Schofield. <clears throat> thank you. I am sorry. Thank you, Senator Dill. Good morning, Mr. Reardon. I, uh, I got to say, first, before I turn this into a question is that I believe your commentary this morning was the most compelling for me, at least. Uh, I, like, I like your position about it being non-regulatory. And I also, uh, I also think that uh, your experiences with, with other agencies or entities that have similar uh, uh, organizations or similar oversight groups uh, is, is interesting to hear. Do you have any further examples of that uh, difference between what we're looking at here and, and those other regulatory groups that you uh, or, or departments that you would deal with? Uh, no, no, I mean, not, not uh, obviously the Board of Environmental Protection and the LUPC board are different. Um, uh, I, I, to, to me, that the biggest difference is um, I know that there is a Marine Resources Advisory Council uh, and an IFMW Advisory Council that meets roughly monthly. I can go on the department's website. Um, I, can, I can see what's on their agenda. Um, I, I can see what the minutes were from the last meeting. And I know that if there's something that's rankling me um, and I'm the gadfly who can't get the commissioner's attention, I can show up at that meeting. And at the end of those meetings, at least at IFNW, every member of the public who shows up has an opportunity to raise whatever happens to be on their mind. Uh, and I have sometimes been the insider People were complaining about at those meetings because the department had talked to me about something and not to them. And I've sometimes been the outsider. Uh, and that's what these public commissions are for. I mean, that's, that, that, that's the role. They provide a level of accountability and access. And I'm sure some of the things I've raised there have been crazy and way off base. And in those cases, they don't go anywhere, but sometimes they're substantive and important. Um, and it's an opportunity for them to get injected where they wouldn't otherwise have been into the discussion. And I, 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 again, I, that's, that's the kind of role I would foresee for this. Um, and um, uh, again, it, it seems to work for other agencies. I don't see why we couldn't make it work for the main forest service. Thank you, Mr. Ridd. Being crazy way off base isn't always a bad thing. 
Thank you. <laughs> Are there other questions? <clears throat> All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next is Dana Duran. Hey, uh, I think it's still morning yet. Good morning, Senator Dill, uh, Representative O'Neill, members of the ACF committee. My name is Dana Duran, Executive Director of the Professional Logging Contractors of Maine. Uh, I'm here to testify in opposition to LD 1549 and give you some other thoughts or ideas. It's actually probably appropriate that I'm talking after Mr. Reardon. Um, but first and foremost, our membership harvests and trucks 80% of the wood that's harvested in the state of Maine is done by one of our members. Our members employ about 3,000 people. The industry employs 3,900 people directly and is responsible for the creation of an additional 5,400 jobs. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to testify in opposition. So I, I just want to state publicly, we didn't have a role in the development of the legislation. We weren't aware of it until really the bill was uh, released last week. Um, so we weren't really aware of what it is trying to solve. Um, certainly we've heard today, you know, what it is attempting to solve, but from that perspective, we're still in opposition. Um, you know, I think I've given you my written testimony, so I'm going to summarize it, but we think it's a bit conflicted. Uh, we think it's very politi political. Um, from that perspective, it also seems limited that it only has a report back to the 130th legislature and is very specific in terms of uh, the forest action plan, but its duties go far beyond that. Um, so let me just give you a rundown on things that have been happening in our industry that we've been involved with that we think are a good model. And I also have provided a potential uh, amendment or idea for you to consider uh, that is much different than what this structure has proposed. So. Since 2016, Senator Collins, Senator King put together uh, something called Four Main. Uh, I know most of you are very familiar with that. We've been before that committee to update you on the work of Four Main. I've invited you all uh, to participate in updates on Four Main. So we've we've made sure that the legislature is very involved. Four Main obviously was uh, put together to try to recreate our industry after a so, uh, significant demise from 2014 to 17. Pleased to report, you know, our goal was to grow the industry from $8.5 billion to $12.5 billion by 2025. And since 2021, we've had uh, over a billion dollars of investment that has been announced. So we are on, uh, on solid footing to move the industry forward. That said, Four Main is going to conclude in 2022. Our funding goes away, that, uh, but I think the structure, the idea, the participation needs to continue in some formal way. As I said, we're opposed to the structure that's been proposed here, but I will say we have provided an idea, uh, something that would be in the executive branch called the Forest Resources Advisory, Advisory Council, and I have provided an example of that. Um, currently, there is no centralized organization with state government that has to do with forest resources, and it should not be just directed at the Forest Service. Uh, many of the, much of the economy is much broader than just the Forest Service. Um, and we believe strongly that it should be in the executive branch, just like we have the governor's energy office, efficiency main trust, the main office of tourism. And there are 18 boards and commissions that are under ACF control that I will also add, which all are also gubernatorially uh, selected. Um, and so I think you need to use that as a guiding point. So again, I've provided an example of what this might look like. The state of Minnesota has a similar structure, Wisconsin, Michigan, it is under the direction of the executive branch, but it is an independent organization. And it also has appointments that transcend gubernatorial politics as well as legislative politics. So with that, I will conclude my testimony and I'm happy to answer any questions. Representative Schofield. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dill. Thank you, Senator Dill. And thank, thank you for being here, Mr. Durant. Will you be available to, at uh, our work session when we bring this bill back? Uh, to, uh, to sort of uh, continue with that line of thought that you just described about those other states and that, and that commission? Sure, I would, I would be happy to, Representative Schofield. I, th I think for myself, that would be an interesting alternative. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Mr. Duran, for your testimony. Um, something I wanted to, um, to ask you about is I heard you um, characterize this bill as political and also um, to say that you weren't involved um, in the process with it. And um, I know that you and I have touched base about this. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you could just please acknowledge that for the committee that 
we have touched base about this. Um, but I want to make it clear that I am always available for anybody to um, to talk about issues with. And I would hope that going forward, um, just we can be respectful of one another because my intentions are are just to do good work here. So I think I, I've been very available. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to acknowledge that Representative O'Neill, you know, when the bill was released last week, I did reach out to you. We had not had any further or any prior conversation regarding it. I was trying to find out, you know, what it was intended to do. Um, I then, I didn't hear back. So I sent you a copy of this advisory council as a recommendation. Um, so that, that I think I will acknowledge and that was our discussion. So I'm absolutely um, uh, willing to acknowledge, you know, our conversation since the bill was released last week. Yes, we spoke. I think we spoke about the intent of it and you understood the intent of it. All right, thank you. Are there other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next is Patrick Strout. Thank you, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and distinguished members of the ACF committee. Patrick Strout from Exeter, Maine, Executive Director of the Maine Forest Products Council. We're opposed uh, to this bill. We've noticed a lot of people talking about our forest um, in Maine. The land is owned by uh, private landowners. The resource of water and wildlife are uh, public resources. So there's a natural kind of collaborative effort that has to take place in the state, but it is, it is privately owned land that I represent uh, with the Maine Forest Products Council and about 8.5 million acres of uh, dues paying members. We think there is not a lot wrong despite some things that were mentioned today. Um, we have demonstrated great stewardship, the wildlife management, progressive wildlife management is about collaboration and we work well with uh, IFNW, there's a forest uh, uh, fisheries network that uh, includes TNC, Audubon, uh, the state, um, and the Federal uh, Wildlife Conservation Service. Uh, the spruce budworm report is something I think this committee was involved with. You should take a look at it and see how that collaboration uh, resulted in requests that we came forward to the uh, ACF committee with. So there's a lot of really important uh, things that have been done. We're certainly open to collaboration. We have not really been that involved in the forest action plan. Uh, I think I've passed that on to my members, but we have not directly commented on that action plan. So it's not a big part of the issue that we're uh, concerned with. And um, I think it's natural for the ENGOs to want to be part of uh, uh, of a of a of this kind of work group. We always get leery if you look at it. If we re represent almost uh, half of uh, land in Maine, we have one commercial forest landowner on this committee. So these processes are always uh, truly um, concerning to us when we talk about stakeholders. So. We think the bill is um, is a duplicative bureaucratic bureaucratic effort. I do need to say that um, the president of the Senate um, crossed the line, crossed the line of uh, truthfulness, crossed the line of uh, uh, excuse and, me, uh, and let's, Patrick, and we're uh, we're protesting that because that is not. Uh, Patrick, can you hear me? You're muted. I muted you. We don't need to be bad mouthing other people here. Everybody needs to be respectful, and I've been trying to express that right along. So um, we'll we'll move on to the next uh, person speaking. Thank you. Tom Doak. Thank you, Senator. Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, members of the committee. I'm Tom Doak. I'm the executive director of the Maine Woodland Owners. We're a statewide nonprofit organization that works 
with the main family woodland owners, those generally own a few acres of land up to several, um, uh, several hundred. <clears throat> um, there are 86,000 of these smaller owners in Maine and they own about uh, one third of the forest land in Maine. Um, I'm a licensed forester and I'm a former director of the Maine Forest Service. Um, while this bill may be well intended, it, it creates a large permanent advisory group which appears to duplicate existing efforts that are going on that have worked very well. Um, and it seems to overlap the role of this committee in the legislature as the policy board and adds confusion to the role of the Forest Service and the director of the Forest Service. Um, we believe instead of a one large permanent group, the more, effect the more effective one. Can you hear me okay? I'm sorry. I, 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 we can now, but you faded out there for a minute. I'm sorry. I'm, I don't control the groundskeeping here. Um, <laughs> I'll just keep going. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm sorry. Um, we believe that with, uh, instead of one large group, the more effective way to address these issue, uh, forestry related issues and opportunities is through the small temporary uh, groups that are focused on, on issues that involve people impacted by the issue and, and experts. And I've got a couple examples in my testimony. One is uh, I'm currently serving, um, and I, you may have heard others, I had to step out, so you probably have heard others. Um, I'm, serve, I'm currently on the task force for creation of a, a forest carbon program designed to look at how smaller owners can play in the carbon markets. Um, we've been meeting since February. We're gonna adjourn. Uh, we will finish our work by September 1st. Uh, that's an important issue we care about, um, but, but it's a focused approach. The one that may be even more applicable is, um, I was on the, the group that, uh, that helped create the uh, State Wildlife Action Plan. We met, uh, this was through IFNW, a big group of us met for maybe a year, worked out the plan. It was a plan that had to be submitted to the federal government uh, and approved by the federal government for their cost share, for their, for their funding. Um, worked through that one year uh, and then that disbanded. Uh, I think that's a good uh, example. It's pretty close, I believe, an example similar to what we're talking about here. Um, we are concerned that a large group will inevitably take resources away from the Forest Service at a time when they're frankly inadequately funded. Um, and the director and the commissioner have the authority to create groups anytime they want. And we think that's a better option. Um, I would say two things. I, we have never had trouble interacting with the department uh, or the director of the forest service. Uh, they've always been open. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I wasn't, I missed some of the testimony, but we've never seen that issue. And the other thing that um, I would note that um, there is no representative, even though we, there are 86,000 smaller owners and one third of the forest land. I, there is no representative representing that interest uh, proposed on this board. So I would urge you if you were gonna go forward that, that those people should be represented as well. With that, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, uh, Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dill. Uh, good morning, how are you doing this morning? I Thank you for being here. I, uh, I just, uh, and you may have missed some of this earlier, but there's been questions raised about the uh, the availability of of the Maine Forest Service to to folks and uh, landowners and whatnot. And, and you represent small smaller landowners. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Both, both as your when you when you were with the director and also in your current position, how do you look at that availability? The the, the way information is disseminated from the Forest Service and the, and the opportunities that people have to engage with the Forest Service currently and have their thoughts heard and their concerns addressed. Can you just elaborate a little bit about that, Mr. Doak? Sure, Representative Scofield. I, and I did miss, I did, I had to step away, so I probably missed a bunch of what has been said, but I picked up a little bit. Um, Sir, in my role now, I mean, I, we, we have had a really good relationship um, with the department and it frankly it didn't matter who uh, with the forest and with the forest service and it really didn't matter who the director was there, you know, there's a very good, it's very easy to inter interact with the forest service. We've never had any issue or the, or the or department itself. Um, so, and I think our, our members feel very comfortable, you know, have had very good success whenever there's an issue they know folks and they are able to talk with them. So I, I've never, I've never had a complaint from any member saying I, I'm, I'm having in, I'm having difficulty talking to someone in the Forest Service. In fact, it's usually the opposite. Very incredibly helpful to them. 
So uh, I don't know. I mean, as director, when I was director, yeah, it, it's a critical role for the Forest Service. And I think it's something taken seriously. And if there are some issues that have been raised and I, I didn't hear those, then then let's fix them. But I, it's not it's not something that is intentional. Uh, I'm certain of that. There, well, there was an issue raised earlier, if I may, Senator Dale. Uh, there was an issue raised earlier about uh, folks maybe not getting their scale right, and to call in a state scaler would be detrimental to their to their work environment or to their job security because uh, because of things that could happen in your in your role as today. If if someone were in that position, what would you say to them about calling in someone to scale their wood? or the price that they were being offered for the wood based on what they actually got, that sort of thing. Talk to me about that a little bit, if you would. I would, I would have no hesitation telling someone that they should, if there's an issue here, you know, get the proper person and call the, I guess, I think this is the question you're asking me, um, you, you know, get, get a hold of the forester or the state scaler or the, you know, the, I guess it's in the department of, uh, it's not in the forest service, but, and, and, um, and, and deal with it. And you should feel comfortable doing that. So go right ahead and do it. I mean, I, I, will, I will often, uh, if I, I have members that will call and have some issue and, I, and I'll help them get to the right person in the Forest Service and say, this, could, this person can help you. And, and I'll, you know, I'll help you, but this person can help you. This is the person that you should talk to and they're gonna be very helpful. And I've, ne I've never heard anything back other than, gee, that was great. I appreciate the help. So, I mean, I'm sure there's some cases that aren't good. There always are. But it is not, it's not nothing widespread that I've ever, that I have seen. Thank you. Uh, Representative Pluker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Doak. I've, <clears throat> back when Woodland Owners of Maine was, was SWOM, I was well, a member for many years. Um, well, we should have you back then. Yeah, I just, I think it's just a matter of sending you a check. That's all it is. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, oh, uh, on this, it has a representative of land trust with a statewide presence. I know SWOM has a lot of land and trust. Do you not feel like that that position would would allow you entry into the board? Well, I, I mean, there's I don't there are a lot, there are tons of land trusts in the state, and I I was I didn't I didn't I didn't see us there, um, but I didn't you know I saw like two logging two logging interests there and things like that, but I didn't see. You know, smaller owners and things like that. Yes, we have a we do have a land trust, but our principal we have a land trust program and own eight thousand acres of land, but that's not our principal work. We are an educational organization, so I'm assuming a land trust would a full time land trust would would take that spot. But Forget that it. was my assumption. Yeah, I I I I had actually looked at the list with the idea of SWOM in mind, and and I thought that maybe also the nonprofit corporation that owns a large amount of forested land might also get yeah. you a spot. It depends on how you define large amount of land, I suppose. But for sure, thank you, thank you, you for th thank you for thinking of us. So. I do. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Next is uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Doak, for your testimony. Um, you, your members were contemplated in this process, and I'd be happy to um, to connect with you before the work session to, um, to talk about that. Um, I wondered if you could. Um, <clears throat> if you could talk a little bit more about that wildlife action plan for IFNW and, and how that served as a, as a parallel with all the meetings that led up to it and the public process stakeholder, similar to what um, Mr. Reardon had mentioned too. Sure, uh, um, the, it was appointed by the commissioner, a group, a group of, and I can't remember, it was a room full of folks, I don't remember how many, but a room full of folks that all had um, in, interests in the forest and wildlife in some fashion. And uh, appointed by the commissioner, um, I think they, they staffed it temporarily. They had some of their staff, but also an outside contractor helping with the development of it. It, it, was, it was a required 10 year plan that, that the department has to submit to, to the US Fish and Wildlife Service and, and uh, have that approved. And um, the work, I think it was about a year that we worked on it. And then they, they did, they sent it out for public comment and, and uh, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And then got the uh, changes and then 
send it off to the federal government for review. And that sounded to me like that was very similar to the, the state force plan, the same kind of requirements and things like that. There's a public, uh, public uh, input requirement in that report. And it sounded very similar to what we were, what the bill, what I thought the bill was trying to do with it. Okay, thanks. So, so it was department initiated, but it was more of that formal process where over a year folks got to meet. You know, it was, some it was, it was uh, I mean, there were some required elements in there, but, but the group was able to, you know, say, these are the priorities. These are the things that are really important for on the wildlife side and uh, work with it. And so it wasn't, was a, I wouldn't call it a full, it was a formal process, but the, you know, certainly the meetings were, you know, a lot of give and take and things like that. They were open. I, be, I believe they were open for the public to watch um, if they, if they wanted to. Not, I don't remember people showing up for that, but they did, they actually held, I think, I think they actually held a public hearing at some point that wasn't well attended. But they did send it out for review and got comments and, and made edits and sent it in. So. Would you be with you or the department for the work session to bring information on that just process wise? Like, were there minutes? Were there? I think that would be helpful to. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of that. Oh, for the work session, just or, you know, between now and then, could you um, confirm that there were minutes, it was public, that kind of thing? Yes. Thanks. Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dope, for being here. Um, um, having your, your position is a little bit unique here, uh, having served on both sides of the uh, spectrum, having been director of forestry, uh, a term at that, and uh, now running a statewide organization of small woodland owners. Uh, where, uh, and, and all the uh, problems that we have in the wood industry today with, you know, lack of markets and uh, uh, lack of labor and uh, environmental uh, regulations and on and on. And, and then uh, uh, where would you see this uh, board? You, uh, could you just give me how you would feel that this board could operate or if it could be beneficial uh, uh, or whether it's duplications, could you just enlighten us a little bit? You know, I think I think one of the challenges from the industry has been, you know, we need to be quicker to respond and quicker to deal with the issues, the, the changes. And um, I th one of the things I like about the the short groups that get together and focus, they can be extremely focused on an issue. And, and get the right people in the room. And this isn't to exclude anybody, but get the right people in the room and, and get something done. And I think, you know, getting that kind of approach seems to work well, you know, let's get, let's, let's get, let's focus on the issue. Uh, my concern is we'll end up with a very, you know, I, I'm, it's well-intended, but a very large group that deals with a lot of things on the, you know, in the, in the really big picture and we will lose the, that quickness to deal with some issues that, Come up and you know they come up we, sh we could get a group together and work on it quickly i think there was you know in the past i think there was a program called this is before my time but i think it was a force for the future or something and that had i think that had a group and after a while it was well now what are we going to do kind of thing so i think it got disbanded i think uh, if i remember right that but it was before my time um but that's i think that's a more effective approach to be honest with you it allows you to be quick and address the address specific issues and not let them get too big but i'm sure i, I missed some of the conversation so i'm not sure i'm not sure what you all heard follow up mr chair sure uh, tom would it can you envision any type of a makeup of a board that would be beneficial to the industry or, could, or would you prefer to bring that back to a work session? Um, would you let me think about that, Senator Black? Yeah, sure. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. And I think that's everybody we have on this today. Is that correct, Cheryl? All right, then I will close the public hearing on LD. 1549, and we'll move on to our work sessions. Um, the first one on our list is LD 264, which we had mentioned we're putting off until next week. Um, so the next one we have is LD 1299, an act to permit 
emergency funding for World Banks when a state of emergency is declared. And that is whose bill? 1299 is Representative Paulus. Yep. And I don't know, is he here just out of curiosity? He, he is here. Okay. Did you want to let him in in case we have any questions for him? I will do that. And I will turn it over to Karen. Good morning. We have seven more minutes till afternoon. <laughs> um, so this bill proposes to authorize the governor to distribute up to 400,000 from the main budget stabilization fund during a state of emergency to nonprofit entities, including food banks, food pantries, and soup kitchens uh, that provide or distribute food to low income indigenous, indigent or unemployed individuals or households without charge. Um, so the Good Shepherd Food Bank of Maine testified in favor. Um, their testimony talked a lot about their role in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic throughout the state. And um, their testimony said that they spent 8.5 million more in the pandemic year than in the uh, year prior with about 7.5 million of the cost growth attributable to the pandemic. Um, and based on their financials, fiscal year 20 financials, 87% of the re revenue is attributable to private contributions and philanthropic grants. And if you include the value of donated food, that would be closer to 96% according to their testimony. So um, they did say, you know, fortunately Mainers responded and because of their generosity, they were able to cover this significant increase in expenses but they pointed out that this is a very vulnerable and risky way to plan for an emergency response, which is why they hope um, the legislature supports this bill. Um, there was no testimony in opposition. Um, the department of ACF testified neither for nor against. Their testimony talked about the temporary, uh, the emergency food assistance program, TFAP. Uh, which supplies shelf stable food to authorize food banks, food pantries and soup kitchens. Um, it's funded by USDA. Um, and the, the department's TFAP program supplies approximately 250 food pantries and other sites with uh, shelf stable food staples at no charge. Um, they did say that their partners indicated most were receiving sufficient food and funding by early summer last year. Um, and the department said that they expect that this um, sort of time frame would be, uh, is expected to remain about the same if there was a future emergency. They did say that there were other pantries and other feeding sites that weathered two or more months of challenges before new supplies and funding became available. So this bill could address that gap in a future emergency. Um, the department did have some suggestions, however, or things for the committee to think about. Um, will there be any parameters about how funds are spent? Will it be limited to food and personnel or extended to indirect costs? Um, how the funds will be allocated? Um, the department advocates for ensuring that pantries and other sites of all sizes and in all geographic locations be eligible to access the funds. Uh, the department also suggested that the state have the ability to advance rather than simply reimburse the funds. And finally, there was a, they suggested that there be a re ready mechanism in place for monies from the stabilization fund to be repaid to the fund if circumstances allow. And there should also, also be stipulations to prevent double dipping. Um, so I will leave it at that for now. Um, you know, the, the main budget stabilization fund, I was just, it, it's actually not a very long um, provision in Title V. And it appears that I was just looking for something that would be similar to what this bill is proposing. And the only sort of two other things is um, there's a subsection six that provides the governor shall allocate funds from the stabilization fund to pay for death benefits for um, you know, state police, fire marshal, 
um, MEMA, that sort of thing, corrections. And then subsection eight talks about um, transferring money uh, to the military training and operations program with the within the Department of Defense. Um, so I'll Are there any questions for Karen? We also have uh, a couple folks here from the department. If anybody has any questions for the department. All right, uh, Representative Hall. I believe this is a good bill. I would like to uh, move ought to pass. It's been moved ought to pass, seconded by Representative Landry. Further discussion, Representative Schofield. Uh, thank you, Senator Dill. I, I too am in favor of it, but I would like to, there were a half dozen uh, additions that the department came up with that, that uh, Karen just read. I was wondering if we could include those as in, in the bill as an amendment or what the process might be. Uh, yes, if you want to ask Representative Hall, if that's, uh, he'll accept that as a friendly amendment. And when, then if he does, we will still discuss the bill. And as I say, we do have the department here, if you have any questions for them. I would accept that as part of my motion. Representative Landry? Right. Yep, okay. So do you have any questions, uh, um, especially since you suggested it, perhaps, Representative Schofield, around uh, um, what the department had suggested. And they say we have Lee Hallett and we have Nancy McGrady here, so. Uh, perhaps uh, Ms. McGrady might respond to that, those those uh, those suggestions, which would now be part of the amend, amended version. She might comment on those, please. Thank you. Sure, good morning, Director McGrady. Whichever one of you is the most appropriate, you can let us know. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you. I'm Nancy McBrady. I'm the Bureau Director at the Bureau of Ag, Food and Rural Resources. And, and also with me um, here today is Lee Hallett, uh, the Director of our Agricultural Resources um, Development Group. And um, she has firsthand knowledge about uh, TFAP and, and many of the things that were spoken about with this bill today. So I, I may defer to her, but um, appreciate uh, the questions about um, our testimony. Um, given that the department um, works with uh, the federal government to dispense the TFAP program, and we also went through a CARES Reimbursement Act process uh, directly relating to, to pantries um, at the end of 2020, we just do have experience in disbursement of funds and, and wanted to um, be thoughtful about those types of questions that, if, if not mentioned in statute, um, get raised later in the process. So whether there would be rulemaking that would be allowed or, or directly written into the statute, some of those generic um, types of, of parameters or requirements, we're certainly open to that. Um, again, just wanting to be thoughtful in the way in which funds are, are um, used wisely and directly and um, to their best use, best utilization. Um, if I could continue, I, I would just say, for instance, um, in, in emergencies, being able to be proactive rather than reactive is really important. So um, the CARES Act funding that we dealt with was purely reimbursement. And, and while very important and helpful, we learned from that that it would be better to ensure that this money, if passed, can be used to pay in advance, can be, it can be outlaid to qualifying pantries so that they can use it on the go and not have to spend up front and then submit later for reimbursement. So those are just things that I think would be beneficial to involve, whether in this in this bill or through rulemaking. Senator Dill? Yes. Uh, thank you, Director. I, I, I would really like those. I think there was like half a dozen. I, uh, Karen read them to us just a moment ago. Uh, do you have anything additional that you would that you would like to propose other than those or other the other than the way those were presented to us a moment ago when uh, when she read them to us i don't i don't believe so i think that those were um those were what came top of mind in our testimony um I, you know it's always a delicate balance of, of wanting to provide um 
guideposts in in a statute in statutory language as opposed to being so descriptive that you've missed your opportunity um, and and then can't uh, do something later without coming back to this to the legislature. So um, you know perhaps there could be language fashion that just uh, allow for the development of parameters by the authority that would deliver dispense the money. I thought things were covered pretty well in that amendment, uh, if that amendment goes through. Thank you very much. Sure. Are there any other questions that anyone has? Further discussion? If not, Cheryl, would you please call the roll? Uh, Oops, sorry. So is it as amended? Yes. Okay. Uh, and is it going to be the more um, generic language that um, Nancy just described that you will defer to the department in rulemaking to establish the parameters and you'll trust that whatever they do or do you want to get into more detail because I don't have any detail at this point other than issues raised. Senator Dill. Representative Schofield. I, I think that you just read half a dozen things that the department wished were included in it. And those were the items that I was referring to as the amendment. Uh, uh, and do you know what I'm seeing there, Karen? I don't have them in I front do. of me. But you read parameters. So yeah. we haven't established what those parameters are. So that, which is fine if you're fine with just telling the department to go make those decisions uh, through rulemaking. That's correct. Okay. And they're going to decide how the funds will be allocated. And they're going to um, I guess we're going to direct them to have the ability to advance rather than just reimburse. Right. Um, and then a mechanism for um, repayment or if, if uh, and stipulations to prevent double dipping. So I Correct. guess that could be spelled out in unallocated language and they would be routine technical rules. Correct. Okay. Representative Pluker. I had a question for Director McBrady, if she's still there. Uh, I believe she is. Thank you. Director McBrady, I'm just looking at the language here. How do you feel about the use of some of those funds to go to farms that are, um, I guess if it, was, if it was a farm that was giving food to a food pantry or a soup kitchen, that would be slightly different than what we're saying here, because this is the money would go to food banks. I guess that from there, that might be distributed to farms. There's a lot of different ways to respond to that representative. Um, yeah. Thank you. Given, given that there are so many different avenues where people plug in to um, emergency relief uh, and food assistance. Um, and I, I, I don't want to speak for, you know, the sponsor of this bill, Representative um, Paulus might, might have some thoughts for that too. Um, you know, I, I think we'd be open to that. I think I might want to request um, Director Hallett to advise too, because she's so she's a little bit more familiar with some of the on the ground, what can happen and with the underlying factor of importance being speed and, and ease of uh, ease of meeting the demand as expediently as possible in, a, in an emergency situation. Lee, did I confuse things or do you know where I'm going? No, I think that was a, a great response. And I would say that, um, we do have programs that help to get that local food into the emergency food system. And so that might be the most direct way. For example, last year during the pandemic, it was kind of the low ebb of our production cycle. Uh, but so, so getting that food into our system regularly is, is an important focus. I don't know if that answers your question, Representative Luther. A follow-up, Mr. Chair. Sure. 
that, do you feel director Hallett or is that, are you a director Hallett? Lee? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, director Hallett. Um, do you um, see the language of this statute allowing you to use these funds for that purpose to, to pay uh, farmers for getting the food to food pantries and soup kitchens? Or would you see, do you want this? Do you, would you like the ability to write rules to let that happen here? I guess is my question. Uh, my interpretation of this, and again, I'd, I'd be interested in, in the sponsor's perspective, but my interpretation was this was for those nonprofit food distribution sites. And it's, it's a relatively um, small amount of money. And so I, I, I don't see a lot of, I, I think it would be maximally used in another emergency at the feeding sites. That being said, many of the sites either have their own relationships locally with farmers or are part of a broader system that has those like Mainers feeding Mainers. Um, and, and then we have adjacent programs that are working on that. So I, I don't necessarily see this as being the vehicle for direct funding to farmers as, as written. Okay, thank you for answering that. And then a follow-up, another follow-up, Mr. Chair. Yes. So, you know, you're very familiar with the Farm Fresh Rewards or Main Harvest Bucks program, which is overseen by nonprofit entities. Could you see this money being used to help those nonprofit entities get that money because in that way we might be able to actually double our money, double this $400,000 by matching federal grants. Um, would you see that as being something that is covered by this language? If, if those programs were being implemented in the service of an emergency food response, certainly that's conceivable. Okay. Would you, would you be okay if we included language like that in this, in our, in our amendment to make it explicit that, that using these funds to, to, to match federal dollars um, would be probably appropriate and encouraged? I think I would, I would yield to, to Nancy's perspective on, on changing the language in that way. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I appreciate being want, wanting to be as expansive and creative as possible so that we can leverage all of the players in, in the field of, of food assistance and emergency response. I'm also aware that this is a limited amount of money to uh, Director Hallett's point. Um, and I, I would perhaps the fix representative Pluker is in the amended language um, to, to add some language about um, and other entities, other qualifying entities with the department's discretion or something like that, which we could speak to in rulemaking. So that if there is an opportunity to fill a gap like that, if it's presented, someone's ready to rock and roll and, and we can make it happen, then, then we've got that there. But I don't want to also, you know, go so far afield that um, we're, we're we're stepping away from um, the sponsor's uh, intent. And I, I like that language. I think we'll include it. But what about the language around uh, trying to use this, giving some priority towards le leveraging federal dollars to to double the impact of this four hundred thousand? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, and, and utilizing to the extent available, um, right. you know, something like that for federal dollars that are available in emergency situations, et cetera. Great. Thank you. Sure. Karen. Representative, Representative oh. Paulus, would you like to comment since this is your bill and you heard the discussion and. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm happy with the language. Oh. Uh, for rulemaking and stuff, kind of keep it um, available for the department for qualified. Okay, great, thank you. I'll go back to uh, Representative Pluker. You have suggested a couple or a sentence or something. Um, can you state that so we can ask Representative Hall if he's willing to take that on as a friendly amendment? Yes, thank you. Uh, I think. Uh, in inserting a, a, a line there. Um, I, I mean, I guess we're, we're going to do a lot of changes on this on this language with some of the amendments that we mentioned earlier. 
So I'm not exactly sure where it would be added in, but um, distribute up to $400,000 from stabilization fund to nonprofit entities, uh, prioritizing use of the money that would allow for matching federal dollars to be used. Uh, and then as we, and then as we talk about the rulemaking language um, to, to say, and within rulemaking language, the department has the, has the authority to look to um, other entities as may be prepared to address the food insecurity issues um, other than those specifically enumerated in the above paragraph. That's a long sentence. <laughs> you are correct on that, Representative. <laughs> it seems so simple when it was being said before. Yeah, I, you, it was like, you mean to write something it was like up? 15 minutes, it. I mean, it's like 15 words long and now it's 15 pages, but uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I, I will go back to uh, Director McBrady and um, I just want to make sure I Karen will be our wordsmith on this anyway, but I want to know if that captured what you and Director Hallett was speaking. Uh, I, I I didn't the way he ended up saying it. I didn't quite think it was the, what I was hearing from 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 you because he definitely put directly in there matching federal funds, etc. And I thought we had talked about a little simpler language than being that specific. And I would just defer to, the, to one of both of you to see where you may be on that particular part. Yeah, I, I do. I understand the intent. Um, and I do think that some wordsmithing is, is in order. I don't know what Representative Pluker just suggested there matched what I was suggesting. Um, I think that there may be alternative language that we can craft that would include the current bill as proposed. Um, and then we would add at the end of that, that of the sentence as it currently exists, um, you know, something along the lines of, and, 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 and utilize or leverage the fund and or leverage the funds um, to match federal dollars or federal programs. Um, I'm, I'm losing my own train of thought. <laughs> I apologize for this. I'm glad you and didn't I'm, have any I'm easier sorry, time. I'm not trying to be a total wordsmith right now that I'm going to bore the heck out of you all by doing that. Um, but I think that there's just a way at the end of the current sentence to add some sort of catch-all phrase, giving the department the discretion to also utilize the $400,000 um, as, as match for qualifying food programs, federal food programs. All right, I'm sure Karen has captured that very nicely and will read that back to us on the language review. But I think we have the gist. So I will go back to Representative Paul to see if he's okay adding that bit into the amendment. I would be fine with adding that into the amendment. My only concern is, is that we make it so difficult that the money wouldn't be available when it need to be available. And I just don't want us to see the writing language in there that we have to have to have matching funds from the federal government. So, but I'm good with, with what you come up with. Thank you. And second and okay, uh, Representative Landry. Uh, I like it, but I'm afraid we lose the emergency bit of the whole thing, $400,000 to take care of an emergency situation. I'll go with it, but I'm I'm just concerned that yeah. Well, I think, I think people who need the money. Yeah, and I think in the language review we'll 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 see how it comes out, and we'll have this discussion again. But I think we have a kind of a working piece to vote on here. I hope so. And Karen, we'll have, try okay. to keep it as simple as possible, please. <laughs> All right, we do yes, have a motion. Sir. We do have a motion on the floor. Yes. Um, by Representative Hall and seconded by Representative Landry. Is there any further discussion? Uh, so I'm just assuming that I can work with uh, Director McGrady on mm -hmm. the most elegant way to say what Absolutely. you just said. 
Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. Cheryl, please call the roll. I will. <clears throat> LD 1299 ought to pass as amended. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill. Yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher. Joseph Underwood. Absent. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McCray, absent. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. Nine, yes, and four absent. Okay, on LD 1299, an act to permit emergency funding for food banks when a state of emergency is declared. Ought to pass as amended, nine, zero, and four. So it does pass. And I will close the work session on LD 1299. And here's where we are, folks. It's uh, 1219. We got three bills left. My suggestion is that we skip over 1407 and go to 282 and then on to 586, which my understanding should be very, those two should be very fast. Um, if I understand from the um, sponsor, which is Representative uh, O'Neill, one will be ought not to pass and the other will be asked to carry over. So we can do those votes and we'll break for lunch and do 1407 because I have a feeling 1407 with an amendment and stuff could take us a little while, but I'm not sure. That would be my suggestion unless someone else has anything else. That looks like everybody seems to be okay with that. Thumbs up, okay. All right, so I will open the work session on LD 282. Karen. Uh, so the title of that one is an act regarding Maine agriculture. It is a concept draft um, and summary says it proposes to enact measures regarding agriculture in the state and uh, it's Representative O'Neill's bill. So I'll defer to her. Representative O'Neill. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I would move ought not to pass on this bill. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Landry. Okay, go ahead, please call the roll. <clears throat> LD 282, ought not to pass. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill, yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black, yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill. Yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill, yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield, yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher, yes. Representative Joseph Underwood, absent. Representative Scott. Yes. He's frozen, I'll come back to him. You were yes. frozen, actually you were frozen too, Cheryl, so. I was? Yeah. I know, it's very Wrong. glitchy this morning. Yeah, it is glitchy. Um, and my mouth wasn't wide open. <laughs> we, we, we won't tell you. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McCray, absent. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. Nine, yes. Four, absent. So on LD 282, an act regarding Maine agriculture ought not to pass, 904. And we'll close the work session on LD 282. 
open up the work session on LD586. Back to you, Karen. Um, so this one is also Representative O'Neill's bill, uh, an act to amend the laws governing agriculture con conservation and forestry. So it's a little more broad. Again, it's like a concept draft and the title basically summarizes the bill. All right, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would move that we carry this over um, to the next session, please. Been moved to carry over. Is there a second? Representative Landry. Okay. Any further discussion? Cheryl, please call the roll. LD 586, carry over. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill, yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black, yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill. Yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill, yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield, yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher, yes. Representative Joseph Underwood, absent. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McRae, absent. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. Nine, yes, four, absent. All right, on uh, LD 586, an act to amend the laws governing agriculture, conservation, and forestry. The vote was 904 to carry over. We will carry that one over. And it, it, and I'll close the work session on that, 586. It's 12.24 uh, by my computer clock. Um, Karen. Um, did you also want to do LD 736? I think that one will also be quick. What is 736? I don't have a uh, So here. this is uh, Representative Grahoski. It's another concept draft. It's an act to enhance the ecological reserve system. Uh, and she did request that this bill be carried over. And uh, she sent you all, or the chairs at least, an email a couple weeks ago in April. And then I think the full committee also received a communication from um, some organizations um, saying why they support that idea of carrying the bill over. Sure. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I move that we carry this bill over to next session. Okay, is there a second? Second by Representative Landry. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Cheryl, please call the roll. LD 736, carry over. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill, yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black, yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill. Yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill, yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield, yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher, yes. Representative Joseph Underwood, absent. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McRae, absent. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. Nine yes, four absent. Okay, on LD 736, again, the vote was to carry it over 904. And uh, with that, if there's nothing else for right now, it's 1226, so why don't we come back at one? and we'll do 1407. Thank you, everybody. Did we say one o'clock? All right, thanks.
Hey, Dave, we're on break until one o'clock. Okay. So I let you know. Representative Hall. Hi, um, yeah. I'm trying to, uh, we need to meet about next week's schedule after the work session today. Um, okay. I did message, I know Senator Dill knows that and I did send a chat message to Maggie, although I didn't hear back from her. So I don't know if you can text or reach out to Senator Black, but if you're available, yeah. I mean, at a minimum I need you know, the chairs of the committee, but if you would like sure. to attend. Um, so I can't set, send a Zoom invite though, because we don't know what time we're gonna end. So we'll figure it out at okay. the end how to do it. Okay, I'll let Russ know. I just was on the phone with him, but I'll call him right back. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Yep, yep. Hey, Karen, I can just, I can just turn off the- The, the YouTube? the YouTube and everybody else will sign off and we can stay on afterwards. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. And I would include yeah, that it. Would work. There would be no attendees either. Right. That, that would be just we could, five of us. Yeah. 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 No okay. problem. Yeah. Hey, Karen and or Cheryl, <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> uh, and I don't know where we are as far as, what has been done and what has been voted on and how to go about recording my vote. Yeah, so all we have left is 1407. Okay. And um, so Cheryl could take you through the votes that have been taken. Um, and yeah, that would be great if she could get your, your okay. vote. Uh, we voted a couple more carryovers and one ought not <laughs> pass and one ought to pass is amended. Okay, very good. Yeah. Cheryl, if you would help me yeah. out. I, I can do that, but I think we need to be online with the rest of the committee before I can take your vote. Oh, yeah. So maybe maybe we could ask the chairs if we can do that right at the beginning. Oh, he's shaking I see Senator Dill nodding his head. He's listening to us. Yes. Don't say anything, Don't say anything bad. bad. <laughs> All right. We'll see you in a few minutes. <clears throat>
Everybody's back. Ah, the important ones. <laughs> I heard important, so I wanted to be darn sure I was included. <laughs> and you are. Me too. <laughs> uh, so, Senator Dill, I did uh, mention to Representative Hall, who I hope reach Senator Black. I messaged uh, Representative O'Neill in the chat. I haven't heard back from her. Have you? I, I'll text her in a second here. So. Okay. <clears throat> but uh, we need to talk schedule. Representative Black, uh, Senator Black was, was on there. So he heard everything we had to say about him, good and okay. bad. Yeah. And he was all good with it. Okay. I was listening too, Sal. <laughs> and he and he still came back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sneaky, sneaky. Hello. Oh, I just heard hey. Maggie. She's okay with it too. I thought you were headed for Connecticut or somewhere, David. Well, I'm I'm somewhere in between. I'm at my daughter's <laughs> house. I heard I'm you were in Florida. Well, I'm gonna, yeah. Well, I'm gonna spend the rest of this day until till tomorrow morning here visiting them, and then my brother, as I mentioned, his his wife passed a couple of weeks ago because of COVID, yeah. and uh, oh, I just want to I just want to spend a weekend with him. I think that's great. I think that's great to spend the weekend with your brother. It's a perfect yeah. opportunity. Well, God bless it you is, for doing it's, it. It's a uh, uh, it's 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 a good thing for both of us. It's a, it's made yep. us a lot closer. So, yep. And we've been close anyway. So. Has he lived in Connecticut a long time? My family, I, I'm, I, you know how the, the boy grows up, goes to school, and then moves away? Well, I grew up, went to school, and the family moved away. Okay. So I stayed in Fort Fairfield. I, I'm just the absolute backwards part of that. I stayed right in Fort Fairfield my whole life. And in 1967, they headed for greener pastures in Connecticut. Did they tell you where they were going? I learned that about five years later. <laughs> <laughs> I had to hire a detective. No, no. Uh, just I was engaged at the time, and I was in my senior year at uh, in Presque Isle, and I really didn't want to just pull up stakes yep. and take off for greener pastures. So, so I stayed and <laughs> never made the break. Smart right. move. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Funny how life plays out. Yep. All right, it's 101. What are we doing here? We got one, two, three, four and a half. <laughs> Five, six. All right. Seven. <laughs> you started with a quorum, so you don't need a quorum. I know, but so I just hope like most it. people that would be here I <laughs> just, I, just, just so they can hear the discussion, but and uh, I realize we can stop, but thank you. Karen, can I record my votes at this point while we're waiting? Uh, if, if Senator we're Dill, yes. Representative O'Neill, is that okay? Okay with me. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. You can, you can shut it off and eat, Maggie. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, Representative McCray on yes. LB. 282, which is an act regarding Maine agriculture. Right. It came out, uh, motioned ought not to pass, and and um, Representative O'Neill asked for that to be killed in favor of a different bill. Okay. I would so vote. Okay. Karen, do you want to go over the amendment? 
for LD 1299. Why don't you do the, the two carryovers first so I can file my, find okay. my file. Okay, we didn't need to do the carryovers, but he can. Um, okay, we carried over two bills. One was 586 and one was 736. So 586 was just uh, kind of a general title related to the laws under the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. So it was a little more broad than the one that was just killed 282, which just pertained to agriculture. So it's just kind of a placeholder, I believe it's Representative O'Neill's uh, concept draft 586. So that has been carried over and I would support Correct. that. I yeah. support that. And the other one was 736. That's, yeah. So that's another concept draft. It's uh, Representative Grahoski's bill relating to ecological uh, reserves. And um, she had requested for a number of different reasons that that be carried over. And the committee, I believe, also got an email or letter from some nonprofit organizations that support that idea because of other work that's going on to carry that over. I support that also. Thank you. Thank you. And now, um, and then uh, 1299 is the act to permit emergency funding for food banks when a state of emergency is declared. Um, and the department had raised some questions about parameters, how the funds would be allocated, um, you know, the ability to advance rather than just reimburse the funds, et cetera. So I think, so it was uh, moved, ought to pass as amended. I think what the amendment will do was grant them rulemaking authority. There'll be some language in there about trying to encourage uh, the department to tr match, to leverage funds, uh, federal matching funds, and um, probably directing them in their rulemaking to kind of establish those parameters on how the funds should be spent and who it should go to, et cetera. So language re review will be important on this one, but I'll yep. work with director um, Nancy McBrady on yep. that language. Okay, and what was the vote on that? How did that? It was unanimous of those present. So it was nine in favor, four absent. Okay, well, I'll jump in with those present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate that, guys. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, Karen, we will turn to you. I will open the work session on LD 1407, an act to provide that a forestry operation that conforms to accepted practices may not be declared a nuisance. Yeah, so LD 1407 would uh, essentially establish a right to practice uh, forestry act. And it says that a local unit of government that allows forestry operations to operate in that local unit of government may not regulate that forestry operation in a manner that limits or prohibits, <laughs> limits or prohibits, I went to bed very late last night, um, any generally accepted forest management practices. And then it directs the department to um, establish by rule or define by rule what is meant by generally accepted forest management practices. So um, proponents of the bill, you know, pointed out that the right to farm law has been in place for many years. Uh, it was in Title uh, 17 at one point under the nuisances chapter. And then um, a number of years, almost 25 years later in 2008, it was moved to Title VII and what is now the main agricultural uh, Agriculture Protection Act. So they pointed out that it's worked well for farming, the farming community, and they think this concept is worthy of being extended to woodland owners. Opponents to the bill, um, you know, are not sure, not aware of any 
huge problem in the state with forestry operations being declared a public nuisance. They wonder why the, the law is needed. And in fact, they think this bill is modeled after um, the National Organization American Legislative uh, Exchange Council, ALEC, which seeks to roll back environmental re regulations in state legislatures across the country. Um, so in terms of information requests, there was uh, Representative O'Neill asked the Maine Forest Service to come back with some information. Um, they did send it to me around four o'clock yesterday. I'm sorry, I didn't forward it to you till like 10 p.m. last night. But um, I believe, yes, I do see uh, Don Mancius in the attendees, so he can address those. But I did forward you his email, and he also had um, some attachments with other, uh, you know, right to practice forestry laws in other states, and then some examples of um, municipal uh, forestry ordinances, although, you know, he did say that particularly the municipal ordinances list is not complete. It's, it's uh, definitely a work in progress, but he uh, can speak to that. Um, so, and in Title 17, um, there is also this provision related to uh, commercial fish, fishing activities and I believe it was the Maine Forest Products Council who suggested we, the committee may want to look at that. Um, there's a provision where, you know, private nuisance actions are limited um, and against a, a person engaged in commercial fishing activity or operations. So, um, you know, that organization suggested that might be a way to amend this bill. And I think I will leave it at that for now, except um, there was also discussions about the Vermont um, right to uh, forestry operations law. And that law um, actually kind of flips it around where the presumption is that the activity is not a nuisance until um, there's a rebuttal process to prove that it is. So uh, that was something else that was, um, you know, suggested for the committee to consider. But I do see Don Mancius, if you want to, in the attendees, if you want him to uh, speak to the information requests. <clears throat> sure, why don't you let him in and that way we have any questions as we're going through here, we can get his input. In the meantime, does anybody have any questions for Karen? Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I couldn't find my button quickly yeah. enough. Um, I don't often see hands, so it's just okay. <laughs> um, Karen, are you able to go over the um, the current processes that are in place? I remember during the public hearing we talked about, um, um, I'm losing my words, I'm just sleepy today. We talked about the um, current processes in place with municipalities for um, making rules and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, I would I would defer to Don Mancius. He did actually attach. Um, are you talking about the relationship to municipal rules and regulations? You know, I I can't remember much more than that. There were there's already um, process and statute for what municipal municipalities have to do when they enact ordinances. Maybe they have to get in touch with the um, with the department. Uh, yeah, I, I think Don would probably be the best person to speak to that. Um, I, I, I guess in some cases they don't find out until after the fact. Um, that was something we heard for public hearing. Yeah, I just like to go through it. I prefer to hear it in a methodical way, kind of taking us through it. Okay. Um, is it okay if Mr. Mancius? Because I don't I think he's right. I think he's know the intimate right. details of the process. Please. Okay. Also, Welcome. Director. Thank you, uh, Representative O'Neill, for the question. Um, Main law. Uh, Would you introduce yourself first, please? Uh, sorry, I'm Donald Mancius. I am Director of Forest Policy and Management for the Maine Forest Service. Thank you. So uh, Title 12, Section 8869, Subsection 8, 
uh, spells out the process for uh, municipalities to adopt their own forestry ordinances. So sorry to interject. Do you, could you have you sent that along to us to follow, or just typically this is something we we go over. That was attached to my original testimony. All right, I'm looking. Yeah. So represent if you went if you go to committee material the electronic LD file, it should be there. Um, under Mr. Mancius's uh, testimony. If not, I can send it to you all. And what number am I looking for? I'm sorry. Typically, we have a folder in front of us, so I'm sorry to keep. So LD 1407. 1407. Right? Yep, and look for Maine Forest Service testimony, Don Mancius. All right. Thank you. Set. Okay, so uh, I guess I should preface my remarks by saying I'm not an attorney, I don't practice law, and I can't provide legal advice. Uh, anyway, Title 12, Section 8869, Subsection 8, uh, spells out the process that municipalities must go through to uh, adopt or amend uh, local forestry ordinances. It's been on the books since 1999. Uh, municipalities that had ordinances adopted prior to uh, September 1st, 1990 needed to have consistent definitions by January 1st of 2001. We have no idea if that process uh, was followed in uh, several of these towns. Anyway, the process is that a licensed forester who is not in the employ of this department must participate in the development or amendment of, a, of an ordinance. There needs to be a meeting sometime during the process between the municipality and the department. And that would be uh, either myself or one of my staff would meet with the, uh, the folks, usually the planning board. Uh, the municipality is required to hold a public hearing on the ordinance or the amendment. They're required to mail notice to uh, landowners unless they are, uh, there's certain exceptions regarding uh, shoreland zoning. Uh, they need to give the, the uh, notify the department of the time, place and date of the public hearing and provide us with a copy of the ordinance at least 30 days before the hearing. They need to provide us with an opportunity to uh, present and discuss uh, the uh, proposed ordinance and uh, you know, it says our ordinances cannot be unreasonable, arbitrary, or capricious, and and need to be uh, use appropriate means to protect public health, safety, and welfare. Provides for uh, uh, submitting costs incurred for the mailing to the department, and uh, suggest and sec subsection nine uh, requires us to have a centralized listing of municipal ordinances. Mr. Chair, may I ask a follow-up? Sure. All right, thanks so much for going through this. And it sounds like it's a comprehensive process that's been in place. And you had mentioned during the public hearing that um, that some of these you found out after the fact and, and that there could be some better communication around um, how to use this process that's in place that looks like it's um, well spelled out. and and protective of, um, of forestry. So what do you think um, on your end you do to work with uh, an organization like MMA or um, or others to, to do outreach to municipalities to make sure that folks know about this process and, and that we can um, make use of the process that's already in place to protect folks? Uh, we, we can certainly uh, work with MMA. I'm, I'm fairly certain that we did back in the day. This was 20 years ago. Uh, 
over 20 years ago. Uh, and we did work with them uh, on uh, making sure that folks are aware. I'm, they, I, I can't verify it, but I have no doubt that they put out some blurb in their newsletter uh, to, their, to their members. Um, we can certainly do, do that again. Uh, the uh, concern I would have is that uh, there's no uh, recourse spelled out in the law for towns that fail to follow the process. And what do you think recourse would look like? You know, I'd have to think about that. I'm not prepared to answer that today. Okay. Maybe you could um, come back with, with a suggestion. Or I'll phrase it differently. Could you please come back with a suggestion about what recourse would look like? I'm not sure about the interplay with state and municipal and, and how that works. I'd also like to hear when folks have had the chance to ask their questions from MMA, if, um, if a representative is here to talk about what we could do to have a better line of communication. Yeah, I'm not sure, representative, that I see anybody from MMA out in the attendees, but we'll okay. keep an eye out anyway, so. Okay, in that case, um, what I'll ask is, um, is that um, you, Director Francis, could connect with them and anyone else you'd see as a stakeholder um, uh, with municipalities talk about how we could do better coordination on this. I, I will say that in the, in the few opportunities where we've had an opportunity to interact with municipalities, uh, there's maybe 13, 14 that have happened over the years, uh, that those processes have, have gone pretty well. Um, and uh, in a few cases, municipalities have been convinced that instead of creating new ordinances for forestry, they've repealed existing ordinances because they found that you know, we were able to convince them that the statewide laws and rules were adequately protective. Representative O'Neill, do I kind of hear in your tone that um, perhaps you'd like to see this maybe as a resolve and we ask them to work with MMA and come back to us probably next year, like in February, with um, some guidance on this? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just kind of gathering from what you've been saying, especially asking them to come back. And as you know, we're got a couple weeks left, actually a week left, technically, but I, I, so I'm just wondering if that's what you might be looking towards here. That's something that would work for me. Yeah, I think, because um, I think what I'm seeing is that we have this process in place and, and that it could be strengthened and that lines of communication could be better. So I think okay. that would work really well for me. I'm just putting that out there as a possibility as we discuss this today. Uh, Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you know, I, I uh, put this bill in for the department. Uh, I think that um, its its tentacles have reached farther than what we thought it was going to with, with some of the support out there. Um, but um, there was a need, the department felt there was a need for this and they, they brought the, 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 the uh, bill to me to present. Um, um, but I don't know how many people have seen it, uh, Karen, but uh, some of us have, uh, they have an uh, uh, amendment uh, that more, more is in more in line with the Vermont uh, bill, but I um, tend to agree with um, Representative O'Neill that um, I think this bill is, too complicated and and uh, this uh, too involved and and too many moving parts to get taken care of within a week or two and so you know her suggestion of maybe moving to a resolve might be a good idea, but before we do that, um, I think Tom Doak is in the waiting room, and I would just like to hear his concerns and and reasons uh, 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 reasoning on this bill if we could. Unfortunately, he's not there, Senator. Okay. Yeah, okay. He probably we probably lost him during our break. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, if the if the committee is is willing to, I think it would be good to probably move this to a resolve 
and and have the stakeholders work on this um, and and come up with something that you know would work good for all of us you know and uh, but that's just I'm hearing where the conversation is going yeah so we could do that I assume Karen and uh, have them report back and allow us to report out a bill at that time is that correct that would work for me Karen that work uh, yep, just uh, so I, what I'm hearing for stakeholders would be Maine Forest Service, uh, Maine Municipal <coughs> Association, uh, maybe the, well, they're always swam to me, but whatever yeah. they're called now, Maine Woodland Owners. Um, Maine Woodland Owners, yeah. Yeah, um, it's, I don't know if there's any other um, organizations that, you know, you would like explicitly included. We could say included, but not limited to, of course, um, to make it flexible, but. Yeah, good, thank you. Rep Representative McCray. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on the face of this, I think if it were enacted as as it is printed, I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's kind of a blank check, a bit of an overreach. I think that if we were to come back after it has been thoroughly vetted and, and discussed by the, the stakeholders, I think we're going to come up with something that's pretty workable. But right now I look at this and I think, oh, that, that takes every bit of power away from any municipality and just whatever forest practices are good in every situation would be applied again in every situation. So I, I like the idea of, of uh, doing a, a deeper dive. I was on we, are, we are making that list of, of organizations that should be included. We have MOFCA, NRCM, and AMC were all uh, participants in the public hearing and should be reached out to. I don't know if we want them all there, but some representation of that group should be on, on the group. Are there other? Yes, Cheryl. Uh, Mr. Doak is here if you want him. Is he? Oh, he is here now. Did you want to hear from him, Senator Black? Yeah, I think it would be good to, and, and he might have heard some of this conversation too. Um, okay. but, uh, if we could bring him in at this time. And and I also would mention, as, as Representative Pluker, we also have Maine Forest Products Council and Dana Dorian with the Professional Logins Association, which probably all, you know, I mean, uh, we need to hear from all the stakeholders groups that uh, are prevalent in this and those are directly involved. So if we could bring in Tom Doak, that would be great. Yeah, DC, would you in, reintroduce yourself, please? Sure. Uh, Tom Doak, I'm the executive director of the Maine Woodland Owners. And I, I did, I was hearing, I, I, technology is a wonderful thing. I could, I could hear you at least, so I've heard the conversation. Oh, good. Senator Black? Oh, yeah. you, do you have a specific question or? Well, yeah, I, um, I guess, um, you know, it's maybe a little broader now that we've started talking about a resolve, but uh, um, I, I guess I just would like to hear your opinion on the need <coughs> and the problems around this uh, as one of the largest uh, organizations of, you know, private landowners in the, in the state of Maine, uh, I guess, you know, the log, log and, um, Woodland owners, if you, if you could just. So I, I think I would like to make it first clear that I, our, my organization is, has no interest in rolling back anything. That's not, this is, I, that, our support of this idea is not that at all. Um, it is, um, and I, as I think I mentioned in my testimony, I have, when I was director, I had some personal experience in dealing with some of these, some, some communities. And um, often the, the, these are driven by something that don't, that don't make a lot of, that, that things that really don't make a lot of sense. And um, so that's kind of the concern is, and then the other part of it is um, there's not real clarity sometimes of what constitutes a forestry ordinance. You know, and my sense is there are probably ordinances out there that are not legally adopted, but nobody knows if they are or not, and, or, or some provisions that aren't, and the landowner is trying to figure out, you know, is this, is this legal or is it not? And um, our concern is this growing, uh, you know, we don't want to grow um, a whole lot of different ordinances and 
the success, I think the thing that interested me was the success of the standardization of shoreland zoning, harvesting in a shoreland zone for forestry, the success that that has seen over the years of one standard that's, that towns can adopt and, and it, it makes sense. And now if you're operating in, multi, in most towns in Maine, you're operating with the same standard and that makes a lot of sense. So I'm, I'm comfortable going forward and taking further looks at this if that's where the committee is, but there's some issues here I think that should, that need to be looked at. And I think the right to farm law has been positive for, for the agriculture community. Other questions, Senator Black, you good? You still have your hand up as all, so. No, I, I if, you know, I'm fine with, um, uh, the only other person, I don't know if, if, if Dana Dorian is in the, in the uh, waiting room and we could uh, have, ask him to just comment briefly too. We'll uh, finish up with Tom Doe first though. Yep. Representative O'Neill. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Doe for um, being here. Um, I think, all right, so it sounds like I would like for you to do talk about um, maybe examples of stuff that you've seen because we were I had the chance to connect connect with um, the commissioner and, and she gave an example of a farming um, a farming example with the nuisance kind of stuff and I'm wondering if you could talk about examples you've seen um, from your members. Well, the standard, the, the differences um, for me within some ordinances are, are opening sizes that don't make any sense. Um, sometimes harvesting, you know, along roads, um, permit requirements that don't, you know, that aren't based on any, you know, anything. Um, there's some things like that, that in ordinances. Um, I do know that, you know, that uh, I don't know if the ever been, I don't know how many suits have been brought. I do know there are often complaints about noise from equipment that's operating. Um, I think most landowners are trying to be careful about operating, you know, um, the challenge of forestry is sometimes it's really weather dependent. And, um, you know, you may have to work at five in the morning in order to get, uh, because of the weather conditions are such that you can only operate certain times of the year. And people are trying to be careful of you know, noise ordinances and things like that. Um, so those are some of the issues that I, uh, that I have seen, um, and um, uh, I'm sure there are others. I'm sure the Forest Service probably has some other examples, um, but I've seen some of those. Thank you. And my other question is about um, just over the next year, I think something that would be useful is to look at how you can, how, you know, stakeholders can work together um, on the question that was posed to Director Mancius. And then I think um, for coordinating with municipalities, and I think on your end, do you do any outreach with your members to educate them about this statutory process from 1999 so that they can be um, not trained, but educated so that if they see a process like this one arise in their home communities, that they'll be able to um, to ident identify it and make that connection so that we can um, help get the department involved? Um, that's a good question. I don't remember writing about this to folks any time recently. I do once in a while get a call from a member that says my town is thinking about a forestry ordinance and I will say, oh, you should remind them if they don't know about the statutory requirements that are in place. Um, but that's the extent. So you, I, that's a good suggestion. Certainly, I could certainly let folks know that this is this uh, exists, so that they would be, you know, that they would make. In some cases, they may, and it's not. I'm not blaming the towns for it. This is sometimes this is something that people just don't know exists. I would guess. It doesn't prevent, you know, the other part of this. It doesn't prevent some things from happening. It just requires the consultation, and you know, so. And some and and my experience has been many times you've been able to convince the Forest Service have been able to show how some of these ordinances are not um, not appropriate or don't do what people think they'll do. But I'm sure I don't haven't seen the recent ones that maybe the Forest Service has. But I bet there are some that um, probably don't make much sense. Thanks, Representative Cray. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This really doesn't have anything to do with Mr. Doak, although I'm glad to see you, sir. Uh, anyway, my, my 
my question is, as we're putting together this stakeholder group to come back, if that's the way we go, uh, is w would the municipal association be part of that group? Because I think that I think the towns need to be represented there, and it's a great way to get the word out. Yeah, I, I think that's where the actual original part came from. They were kind of like the two originals, and then it's broadened out beyond them. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I would suggest if you're thinking about people to add, um, there, you might want a, a forester or two that works in many towns because they have often have some of the best information about the requirements in individual towns. So I would I, I, suggest saying, that as a list. Yeah, are you saying, uh, Tom, that this actual town forest is like employed by the town? No, I mean, consult, uh, cons you know, some consulting oh, forces that work in several towns, yes. Because yeah. I think they would, they would have, you know, real life, experiences of dealing of the challenges of dealing some of the towns okay great thing representative schofield thank you senator dill uh thank you uh tom for being here and, and uh, i anecdotally i know that where i live uh forest products are important and i guess it's forestry friendly up here and logging friendly where i'm at in most of my district but the I'll give an example. A couple of years ago, I had some I had some timber harvested on my property, and uh, I live in a rural area. But I do have neighbors, and some of my property, most of my property, surrounds others. And uh, so we put out a notification prior to the harvest. My forester did, alerting them to the fact that it was going to be occurring in approximately the start date and approximately the end date. Fellow bunchers and forwarders make a lot of noise. And when they start operating, sometimes it's three o'clock in the morning, especially in the wintertime. And uh, they'll operate until mid-afternoon, some cases. And uh, generally they don't operate, at least in my situation, weekends or on Christmas, which brings me to the point, I had a neighbor who was concerned that on Christmas she was having family and she didn't hope that there wouldn't be logging going on to disrupt their Christmas next to her property. And I assured her that that wasn't going to be the case. But my, my point is, we have seen a change in our dynamics or uh, the, uh, the makeup of our areas recently, par par partially because of the pandemic. People have come from more urban areas. And with the increase in which I'm agreeable to with broadband, we're apt to see more folks who might be migrating to the woods, so to speak. And some of the concerns that folks have, a lack of concern right now for logging, because they understand it, might not be shared with those who, who begin to filter into the woods, so to speak. And I was just wondering about your thoughts on that, uh, uh, Mr. Doak, and, and, and see what you think about that. I think that's a concern we need to think about. Thank you. Um, I can tell you that, you know, I think I mentioned the committee, we own 8,000 acres of land in 76 towns. So we are operating in a lot of different towns and we spend a fair amount of time, you know, if we're going to have a harvest somewhere, talking to every, trying to <coughs> notify every single neighbor to try to, um, you know, avoid some of those. But yeah, we spend a fair amount of time talking to people and because their first thought is we're going to develop the property or something. So when they, you know, that's their first thought is, is when, when is the house going to be built? So when you convince them of that, that helps often. But uh, I, I think our concern is that we, we think there are probably ordinances out there that are not legally and the landowners are being bound to something that doesn't make sense. And there's not been a consultation. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. That's my sense. And then also that we're likely to see more of these, um, more and more of these. And that's a concern we have. Um, at the same time, we know there's some successes, and I again go back to the shoreland zoning standard, there's some successes if you do it right. And so there's an, I think there's an opportunity here. I think the concept is valid. The details of it, I think, are to be worked out, but I think there's a, I think there's a concept really worth pursuing here that's not trying to undermine environmental regulation or, or anything. Thank you. I, th I think it's something we need to be cognizant of because going forward, I think we're apt to see more concerns about logging rather than fewer. As newer generations come on, the, the, uh, the folks who have been aware of it in the past and actually participated in it may not be there going forward. I think we need to, we need to protect the landowners and the ones who are currently in the business. So thank you. 
Representative Schofield, I, I would bet that the right to farm law went into place as a direct result of what you were talking about. That would be my guess. I, I wasn't involved in it, obviously, but I would guess there were probably a number of people that weren't comfortable or weren't used to being around farm or something. I'm not sure, but I'm sure that it was the same kind of thing that happened that, that prompted the right to farm. Something, something surely did, I would bet. I bet you're right. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mr. Dope? Uh, was there someone else uh, that somebody wanted to hear from? Mr. Chair, uh, is, is Dana Dorian in the uh, waiting room? Uh, if he is, I, I'd like to hear what his thoughts on it. Yes, he is. Yeah. Could you bring him in, please? Yes, I will. Hi, everyone. Dorian. Would you introduce yourself again, please? Sure thing. Good to see all of you again. Uh, Dana Duran, Executive Director of Professional Logging Contractors of Maine. Your question, Senator Black? Yeah. Um, this, what, what's your feeling on, on the bill that was presented and, and uh, where we, uh, if, you, if you've been in the waiting room, you've heard the conversation of maybe moving forward, you think there's a need for this and if the stakeholders group would be a way to do it um, and anything else you'd like to mention on, on this, this issue. Yep. Sure. Uh, thanks for the question, Senator Black. So yes, I, I have been in the waiting room and I have listened to the conversation and I think it's been a, a very positive discussion thus far. Uh, in terms of the ori original legislation, you know, I, I think it probably it was a, a long shot at, at best, and it probably, I, I agree, it, it probably goes too far. Um, that said, you know, I know Senator Black uh, sent around a an amendment, which I think is plausible. Now, does it have to happen this session? No, is a, a work group uh, an idea to try to move forward with uh, discussions uh, with stakeholders, absolutely, it's 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 fine with me. Um, could the end result be something similar to what is in the amendment uh, that Senator Black uh, has out there? I, I would hope so. You know, I think there's an there's an argument for parity here. The right to farm law, if you compare, and I've taken a look at the current uh, Agricultural Protection Act, and I've compared it to the amendment that Senator Black put forth. And I would say they're almost identical um, at this point. There's, a, there's an argument for parity here that I think is very important. Um, and so that's, that's my perspective, but obviously I don't expect the committee to dissect something. Um, I will just add a couple of other things that might be helpful. So one with respect to Vermont, um, a gentleman named Sam Lincoln, who used to be the deputy director of the uh, uh, Department of uh, Recreation, Forestry, and Lands, uh, who is a logger. He's actually a master logger. He's left that position and gone back to logging, was instrumental in that, that moving forward in Vermont three years ago. So happy to provide him as a resource, whether it's to the committee or the stakeholder group, to give you their perspective in Vermont. So that's one. And then two, I know uh, Karen just sent out the examples of municipal forestry regulations uh, as a snapshot of what's happening across the state. And so from the, the logging perspective, and this is a good list, it certainly is not completely exhaustive because I will share, there are certain ordinances that have popped up in towns um, with respect to, let's, let's just call it movement of, of round logs um, at specific times of the year, contractors have to get a bond in certain towns even in frozen road conditions to be able to move wood. And that adds cost. And if you look at that list that Karen provided, almost every single one of those requirements adds cost to the contractor. And it's not going to be the forester that's gonna take that cost. It's not gonna be the landowner. It is going to be the contractor that is going to have to absorb those costs. Um, you know, as, as you just heard, and, and Mr. Sco, uh, Representative Sco, Schofield pointed out, Logging is disruptive. Logging is loud. We, we understand that. It's not something we can hide. If you could put a silencer on a fellow buncher, great. It, it does not exist. Uh, and it's not a sound that everybody hears every day. Farming is your neighbor. Farmers, you know, if you live next to a dairy farm, 
uh, you know what to expect. You know that they're going to be up at certain hours. There's going to be certain times of the year that they're cutting hay at midnight because rain is coming. They're going to be running their tractor. You know that. When a logger comes next to you as an abutter, you know, we always tell our folks, you know, obviously communicate with the abutters, let them know what you're going to do. When are they going to operate? But weather has a huge role in this industry and with climate change, you know, frozen conditions uh, are changing constantly and limitations on operational conditions are existent and it's getting shorter and shorter in terms of the duration to make a living. So I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to answer any other questions. I think this conversation's headed in the right direction and I would like to see parity because I think loggers and forestry should be treated the same as farmers. I don't think we should be differentiated against, so. Any other questions for Mr. Duran? All right, seeing none, thank you, Mr. Duran. Thank you. Uh, anyone else anyone needs to hear from? Anyone wanna make a motion? Everybody want to go home. <laughs> Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, all right, I'll try to throw something out now. I know that we'll have language review, but um, what I'll suggest is that um, we direct the department to meet with stakeholders. Stakeholders include um, Swom and other folks that have been here um, today, including um, MOFCA, I think NRCM, AMC. Um, feel free to jump in with, I know, I think Representative Pugrillis did some earlier. Um, and what I really like to see, because um, I think the conversation moved, <laughs> moved toward the, the nuisance law again. And what I really want to see is a conversation about outreach to municipalities. So connecting with MMA and others about strengthening outreach about the laws that we already have on the books and, um, and making that process work. Um, and I want, um, oh, we can't direct private people. We mentioned to Swam about reaching out to members about process and how to engage. Um, so that would be my motion and to have a, a report back about, um, about this next year and include the ability to um, to have a bill if we need it. Great. Seconded by Representative Landry. Discussion. Senator Black. Um, I I would pretty much agree uh, with with most of uh, Representative O'Neill's uh, motion. The only only concern I have is is the size of the stakeholders group, and if we could keep it to uh, groups that are stakeholders that have, uh, you know, like uh, Maine Woodland owners, Mofker, uh, maybe Appalachian Trip, people that are actually in direct contact, um, you know, instead of, you know, organizations that are lobbying organizations, just, you know, uh, you know, if I'd like to see it stay with people with vested interests, you know, like Appalachian Trail, you know, they have forest land, they're fully aware of, you know, Mofker membership has membership that own woodlots. If we could, you know, uh, professional loggers are directly affected by this bill, um, name woodland owners, uh, maybe Farm Bureau, uh, but groups that, you know, but we've got to, you know, I, I think we've got to include most of those groups but I'd like to have them have vested interest or you know direct uh, involvement in it if we could. Those four and, groups work and, for me, and I think the department is here and listening if we need to write those and, four. And, and 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 yes, yes, I agree. And and may and we need to make sure that we reach out to Maine Municipal or the towns. You know, they need to be part of this group too. Yeah, yeah. So I would I would second that motion. Oh, it was already seconded. I just discussion, yeah. So, further discussion. All right. Seeing none. Cheryl, please call the roll. Yes. LD fourteen oh seven ought to pass as amended. Senator James Dill. Yes. 
Senator James Dillon, yes. <laughs> Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black, yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill. Yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill, yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield, yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher, yes. Representative Joseph Underwood, absent. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McRae. Yes. Representative David McRae, yes. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. 10, yes. Three absent. On LD 1407, an act to provide that a forestry operation that conforms to accepted practices may not be declared a nuisance. Ought to pass as amended, 10 in favor, and three absent. I will close the hearing on 1407. I mean, the work session, excuse me. Karen, anything else that you need from us before we let people go, except for those that need to stay on for a bit? Uh, nope, just need to talk to chairs and leads about scheduling. Okay. Uh, Cheryl, anything you have? No, just a reminder to keep your eyes open for uh, emails from Casey Milligan and Ada Gagnon. Those are uh, reports that report outs that cannot be finished until you okay that your what you voted is what you actually wanted voted. So though we have some that are being held up because people haven't seen them in their mailboxes. So keep an eye out. Representative Landry. You're set, anyone else? Can I have a motion to adjourn? Representative Landry, seconded by Representative O'Neill. All in favor, none opposed. Thank you all. Chairs and leads, hang on. Cheryl will get us all straightened out. I'm gonna 